morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the January 31st, 2023 meeting of the Board of Supervisors. We could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Cummings? Here. Hernandez? McPherson? Here. Koenig? Here. And Chair Friend? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. If we're going to begin with a moment of silence, I believe uh, Supervisor McPherson, if you'd like to lead this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to acknowledge the tragic shooting death of 18 year old uh, Rowan Parnham of uh, Bullock Creek on Saturday night. Um, we are keeping his family and uh, students in our hearts today. And I'd like to remember him in our moment of silence this morning. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Anybody else have any comments? Let's have a moment of silence, please. Can you please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Into this whole liberty and justice for all. Mr. Palacios, are there any changes to today's agenda? Yes, we have uh, two changes on the consent agenda, item number 44. There's a revised memo uh, replaces packet page 443. And then on item 72, staff requests that this item be deleted. Uh, remove package pages 882 to 909. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. Are there any board members that'd like to remove an item from consent to the regular agenda before we open it up for public comment? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd like to pull item number 38, uh, the four leaf contract, and place it on the regular agenda for discussion, for a broader discussion by the board on this. Okay. Um, item 38 will become. Um, item 11.1, .1, is that okay, Madam Clerk? Yes, thank you, Chair. Okay, we'll now open it up for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are either not on today's agenda or within, or on our consent agenda, or if you cannot stay, items on our regular agenda. Is there anybody that would like to address us from chambers, please? Feel free to step forward. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chairman, uh, Supervisors. Um, by the way, there's no places for people to park out there to attend. Um, you show your hatred for the public time after time, uh, both by making it very difficult and censoring people here at the very podium. Um, the fact that you do not report your secret meetings uh, of a cog of a Soviet of AMBAG uh, to the public, the fact that it's not even taught in our schools is outrageous. Uh, the people have no idea the degree of uh, distraction and input from the World Bank and the United Nations through uh, the phony regionalization organizations in which you're taking away the people's right to govern. You no longer represent us. You represent those you're taking the money from, including the California League of Cities, which is uh, not only racist, but figurative. The person that founded it, it was a Governor Fillane and his brochure reads, let's keep California white. The California League of Cities is a scourge and a, a slap in the face to the American citizens. Also, wearing a mask is absolutely outrageous. Uh, there has been a suppressed report. You'll have more than 86 different uh, references to this the fact that the mask is dangerous even to surgeons who perform surgery for more than a half hour. They've shown it's detrimental because of the increase of carbon dioxide and lack of oxygen. Um, the also, the very fact that you had a secret donor fund the person that said which businesses were uh, important and which ones were not vital. There is certainly, I think, grounds for lawsuits against those people, including Palacios, who is part of the Community Foundation and is also part of uh, Bruce McPherson's Thank Green you, Energy. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Good morning. Good morning. Not my first time to come to the board, but new players, welcome 
to both of you. My name is Richard Lewis. Three years ago, I came, if you don't remember me, when Susan had that letter to me, and I spoke about Grupo Amistad. Today, I'm asking to see what we can do at the next election at Cabrillo College. Check out that nobody raised their hand. This is Leadership 101 if people were here. Check it out. We got a trustee now moving on up, my friend, I hope. I have the domain name for a different kind of union. And I hope there's leadership from the board and other people from having the domain names for a homies union, one that moves forward, what is possible. He, I've done my homework. I can't speak for three minutes and transfer, but I can in person. Back in those days, we mentioned that in 75, there was a county of Santa Cruz Youth Commission. I ask you to research through staff that there's a whole lot of possibility. The former youth commissions in Watsonville and in Santa Cruz were high school. Now there's a county law that creates the California Youth Empowerment Commission. Who can do it? Not me. Maybe not even Matt, the chancellor at Cabrillo. But boy, you have a hub of a diamond with Dr. King's statue from George Owl overlooking our county. So my name, unimportant. I'm not going to give up. I believe that you can Thank have you. a use. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, thank you. I do. Good to see you. Is there anybody else from the chambers that would like to address us? Good morning, sir. Hi, how are you all? My name is Garth McDonald. I'm public information officer for SBA's Office of Disaster Assistance. I just wanted to stop by real quick and, and um, address you all in person. I've met a couple of you so far, and uh, I've exchanged emails with a couple more. But um, I'm here in Santa Cruz County representing SBA's Office of Disaster Recovery and Resilience. We're here to help individuals, not only businesses of all sizes, of course, private nonprofit organizations, but homeowners and renters. In fact, a majority of our low interest loan funds that go to federal major disasters actually does go to homeowners and renters to rebuild their house, to replace personal property. And we also, um, assist them with various other resources as far as getting them funds before the insurance companies might settle. We can cover funds for rebuilding and recovery, sort of the long-term recovery arm of, of the federal government. And we do it with uh, low interest loans for most homeowners, 2.3% fixed rate, no payment for the first 12 months, no interest now accrues for the first 12 months, which is a new offering by our administrator. So they're very favorable. Most people don't want loans because they're hit by a disaster, of course, but it's usually the best source of federal funding that's available to get people as close to pre-disaster condition. I do know, I grew up in Santa Cruz County, In uh, went to high school in Cabrillo College, and so I know the area well, I was here in 82, but uh, there's a lot of dis issues that up in the San Lorenzo Valley, a lot of problems that we can't fix. Some of it, the federal government can fix over the long term. Hopefully we can work with the county. I have uh, this one flyer I'm gonna leave for you folks. It's, it's really the most important thing that a, a borrower should look at because it has pretty much all the details of what they need to do, steps to apply. So I'll leave these these in my cards for you all, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Thank you for your communication with Here, us. I'd like to thank Mr. McDonald. Um, he was, uh, we had a town hall meeting in Ziani about a week ago, and there was probably 250 to 300 people there, and you were there along with everybody else. Uh, Congressman Panetta and Sheriff Hart and others and uh, Steve Wiesner from our County Public Works Department to explain some of the road damages and so forth. It was very well received and I thank you for being there. Uh, I thank you for 
really, the, I want to say to the state and federal government for this attention they've put on our county to get it rebuilt. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Hernandez. Chair Friend, um, I, I didn't really want to necessarily pull an item, but on, on 39, I want to see if I can add some additional uh, information to it. Yeah, uh, Supervisor Hernandez, we're still doing public comment. When we bring back to the board, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. I'll take a note, though, to make sure that we have that. Is there anybody else who'd like to address us during the public comment time from the chambers? Please, step forward. Thank you. Good morning. Sorry, traffic from South County is a lot of fun. Um, my name is Jennifer Fontes, and I'm here representing our community that was hit by this past disaster. Um, we lost our whole bridge to our community of 31 people and homes, and we are now using a very emergency easement through our neighbor's front yard to be able to even get out. Um, we have reached out multiple times to a lot of the people in the county government and haven't really received any kind of responses, which has been kind of difficult and disheartening. Um, and we've taken it upon ourselves as our community to go out and we've applied for FEMA. We're, um, we're in that process right now. And FEMA has been really responsive and the federal government's actually been really responsive and helpful. We are now stuck with a bridge in a river that we're not technically allowed to touch. And nobody's been helping us figure out who to talk to, what permit process to go through. And we've reached out to multiple agencies with no, no help other than finger pointing. And all we're seeking is not even funding, just maybe an expedition on expediting permitting or removing a bridge that's damaging and eroding the river further and just waiting for another storm. That's all I'm looking for. Guidance, assistance through the permitting process. We're already sourcing our own funding and it's a private bridge, but it's just a regular community of 31 people. And it's also a major fire access road and escape route. Eureka Canyon and Browns Valley in Corlitas. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fontes. I, I do believe uh, our public works director would like to connect with you there on the right. Is there anybody else here in chambers that would like to address us before we go online? Okay, seeing none, Madam Clerk, is there anybody online that would like to address us? Yes, we do have speakers online. Thank you. Maria Elena, your microphone is now available. Good morning. Uh, this is Maria Elena de la Garza. I am the executive director to the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. And let me start off by saying Happy New Year, Board of Supervisors, and welcome to Supervisor Justin and Supervisor Felipe. It's great to have you there. Um, I just wanted to uh, address, I, I believe it's comment uh, or agenda item number eight, um, but I have to leave a little bit early today. I just want to say thank you to for our partnership with our, with our county partners. Um, we have a program together where CAB provides and serves as a trusted messenger to ensure that information is getting, getting out to the immigrant community, specifically folks who speak Spanish, specifically folks who speak indigenous languages. Um, this partnership has served and has done amazing work in connecting the folks who are furthest away from, from the county systems to get a little bit closer, to feel a little bit more trusted. Because as we know, the anti-immigrant rhetoric that we are just at the tail end of uh, because of a federal administration of a few years back um, really pushed our immigrant community into you know further away um, and into invisibility um, and so this partnerships with the county like this one between the county and the community action board has really set the foundation to understand that trust is 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 earned um, and that trust can be built and so I want to thank you on behalf of the community action board I want to thank our county partners 
Irma Marquez and Randy Morris and Kimberly Peterson for acknowledging that there is a space that is only um, that is best filled by a community based organization. And that's how we move forward. And so thank you for that. Um, and uh, more to come. Uh, have a good year. Happy New Year to all. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Um, this is Marilyn Garrett. I ask you to stop the slaughter of the trees along Highway 1, the Aptoso Kel area. It's horrific clear cut. I am uh, referring you to a couple of years ago, I asked the board to sign on to the international appeal to stop 5G on Earth and in space and gave you the documentation. I ask you to do that again as no action was taken to protect the public. An update on this from Arthur Furstenberg author of The Invisible Rainbow, A History of Electricity and Life, and he is the administrator of the International Appeal to Stop 5G on Earth and Space. You can read the whole document at arthur at cellphonetaskforce.org. This is from December 14th last month, titled The Ecoside from Space. Number of operating satellites passes 7,000. On the evening of Thursday, December 8, 2022, OneWeb launched 40 satellites from Cape Canaveral, Florida, bringing the total number of active satellites in orbit around the Earth to more than 7,000. These cell towers in space are altering the electromagnetic environment of the entire planet and are debilitating and exterminating all life on it. Even the first fleet of 28 Thank military... You, Ms. Garrett. Chair, we have no further speakers online. However, I've been made available uh, aware that there's one additional speaker in chambers. Perfect. Thank you. Please come forward. Morning, sir. Morning. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Jose Barajas, and I'm here representing Second Harvest Food Bank of Santa Cruz County. I just want to thank you all so much for your support. Um, we've really been able to partner up with you all during these last couple of weeks with the floods. We've appreciated the support that the county has lended us. With your help and your support with the county, we were able to feed almost 8,000 8, meals throughout the county for those that were evacuated. We were supporting those at the fairgrounds, and we were supporting those up in the valley. With that continued support, we've also been able to reach out to many folks for CalFresh with the support of Randy Morse and Irma Marquez, who is going to be speaking as well. And we'd really just appreciate your support that you've done. The food bank continues to support the county when it needs it the most, and we're going to continue to find strategic ways to continue to reach those that haven't been able to access the food bank. Over the past couple of weeks, we've seen an increase in people that have needed our support. A true testimony has been somebody out at, last week at Ramsey Park. We were handing out food um, emergency boxes. Single dad, two kids, lost his home out by the levee came in, was shattered in tears, had just lost lost his work as well. We were able to give him a box of food and we were able to give him that support that he needed to register for CalFresh. So again, thank you so much for your continued support. We appreciate all the things that the county and that you all continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Okay, we'll close public comment and we'll bring it back to the board to discuss uh, consent items. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, there's a couple. Um, number uh, 31, the broadband uh, grant. Um, we've been pushing for greater connectivity uh, for years for more rural areas in our county. And this is an opportunity to to identify how we might, uh, might get there. And after facing our fourth disaster in six years, the rural areas are disproportionately affected by 
um, the flood and debris and the flow and even makes it more critical than ever that we improve connections, especially in the isolated areas. And uh, we all know where there are. A lot of them are up in my district in the San Lorenzo Valley. But um, this broadband grant, I know that the uh, national uh, NACO, which you uh, represent our county in, Mr. Chair, and myself at uh, CSAC, the California State Association of Counties, broadband connectivity is a high priority for both state and federal agencies throughout uh, certainly this county, this state, and this nation. Um, and the number 48, the storm recovery update, um, we can go a long time about talking about this. And I want to just thank our Office of Response, uh, Recovery and Resilience for this update. And we look forward to some town hall meetings that are be going to be coming uh, on February 2nd and 7th to talk about uh, the rebuilding process. And the Zoom link to that can be found on the County Storm Recovery website under uh, public meetings. Uh, they're going to be at 6.30 on February 2nd and it's February 7th. And it's going to be a countywide town hall. I want to thank the county personnel who were uh, part of the immediate response uh, to the recovery. I know we all do. We all had severe impacts in our districts. And I want to also thank our state and federal office holders who have been very engaged in conversations with the county on funding and other resources to help our residents. Um, Congressman Panetta was uh, at the Zion uh, town hall that we had, as I mentioned earlier, and issue who represented uh, that the North County prior to the recent redistricting was always on top of it. She's still engaged very much with what we're doing. Uh, we've seen uh, U.S. Senator Alex Padilla here a couple times in the flood recovery uh, grant that we got and then some of the issues that are facing us now uh, in Capitola in the second district and, and elsewhere as well. So we really have some great response from our state and federal office holders and I, I want to thank them profoundly. Uh, we know that past disasters that uh, given that the amount of damage countywide, this promises to be a long recovery. And I know all of us are on board with the staff to work things out as quickly as we can. And I'm glad to see the disaster recovery centers in Felton and Watsonville. And it's my hope that the uh, the number and uh, those agencies and nonprofits engaged will uh, result in problem solving at a very quick pace, as quickly as possible. I visited the one at the Felton Library in, uh, in the San Rosa Valley. A lot of people were there. There, every agency you can think of for disaster recovery was represented there. And we heard a speaker from the Small Business Administration here this morning as well. So uh, thank you to the community uh, members uh, for your patience uh, and for your kindness that you've uh, given to others in our county. It's very much appreciated. And uh, we'll get through this one, too. I think we've had enough of it, but uh, that's not for us to say, I guess, which one's going to come next. But um, we are getting getting to be experts at disaster recovery. And I, I just want to thank the people in the communities that really were hardest hit for getting together and helping one another. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. I want to echo the commendation for our county staff who worked many tireless hours throughout the disaster, in particular to uh, our county roads crews, who I know have put in many, many long days. And um, I think as you heard from the earlier speaker uh, during public comment, our road infrastructure is in incredibly vital. I mean, it is the lifeline to the rest of our community. And so uh, I really, uh, again, want to thank our road crews for making sure that people are connected and, and whenever possible and, and can uh, go back to life as normal. I also don't think we should gloss over the um, you know, relatively seem seemingly small actions that I know made a really big impact for people during this crisis. So uh, the 1 million pounds of sand that were distributed. You know, that was really uh, appreciated in the middle of, of all these continuous floods uh, for people to feel like the county was providing something concrete, something you know, literally uh, heavy that they could use to protect their homes. That made a big difference for people. Um, and, and also the dumpsters. I appreciate the CAO's quick action, make sure we were able to get dumpsters out to communities so people could begin to clean up uh, and you know let go of the things that were damaged through the storm. Um, and that was really helpful, especially as we um, mobilized a lot of volunteers both through the volunteer center and other, um, other folks who flew in from all parts of the country to help over the last couple of weeks and helping people to clean up their homes. Of course, there's, uh, as Supervisor McPherson said, we're, we're becoming experts in uh, disaster services and we can always do better. And so to that end, I look forward to speaking about um, 
item 38, which we can move to our regular agenda. And I want to thank Supervisor Friend also for item 39, the contract for emergency public safety notifications. Uh, you know, I think we all did our best to get information out during this crisis, but we could definitely do better in terms of uh, cohesive messaging and making sure we're all on the same page. So uh, thank you, Chair Friend, for that. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor Hernandez. Well, first, I'd also like to thank um, all the public works crews that worked tirelessly out in South County to stabilize the, the boils that we had over there and, the, and to stop the seepage on the Pajaro River. Um, you know, there were several hours that it was really critical and they worked tirelessly overnight, long hours, probably overtime. So I want to thank them for really being heroes out there uh, working hard. And second, I want to thank my new commissioners, Yesenia Jimenez, Olivia Madrigal, and Karina Moreno, and thank them now for their future uh, service to our county. And I also want to thank uh, Zach Friend on item number 39. Uh, one of the things that we, that this weekend I went to was the, uh, I attended the city of Watson's legislative conference and legislative breakfast. And afterwards, we had a little bit of discussion, sideline discussion about some of the issues with the city manager over there. And you know, one of the things that we talked about was the uh, emergency notifications. And uh, we wanted to, you know, I think one of the things was that we wanted a more user-friendly, a user text-friendly sign-in process for the notification systems, and also a more user-friendly map system without codes. Um, but I think the most important thing is uh, that the city was, you know, we were talking about was uh, making sure that we all align. And so if we could take those three things into account, if we can align our systems, uh, probably all the cities would probably be uh, beneficial uh, in the future if we align our, our emergency notification systems. And that's pretty much it. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Excellent suggestions. Uh, Supervisor Cummings, good morning. Good morning, Chair. Can you hear me? Okay. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, um, community members and staff. Uh, I have a couple comments. Uh, the first is on um, item number 55, which is grants from Fish and Wildlife. Um, I'd just like to thank the commission for making these recommendations to the board. Um, I'm especially appreciative of the inclusion of the environmental stewardship pilot project that will partner with the downtown streets team, the coastal watershed council to help in, uh, remove invasive species uh, from that, from the river. So just wanted to express my appreciation of staff's work um, on securing that funding. Uh, the second was item number 57. Um, this is CalWORKs funding uh, that would go towards community action board to help with um, eviction protections. And uh, as a renter, you know, and, and as we know with, uh, the affordability crisis we face here in Santa Cruz that many low-income people uh, can sometimes find themselves at the point where uh, they're facing eviction and just in need of additional funds to help keep themselves in their homes. And so just wanted to thank the um, Human Services Department staff for working with Community Action Board to provide additional funding for eviction protections. Um, and it's really critical that we uh, continue to support these programs, especially when people are faced with disasters and out of work and really need this kind of assistance just to stay afloat. Uh, the last item I was going to comment on, and before I do, I do continue on to express my appreciation of staff and how they're helping with the disaster response. Um, I think my colleagues have, have really done a good job of expressing how hard folks have worked, but I just want to also add my appreciation for their work as well during this difficult time. Uh, but the last comment I want, the last item I wanted to comment on was item number 63, um, which is related to private youth transport uh, companies involved in child custody reunification proceedings. Uh, I really want to thank the staff for bringing this item back to the board. There was a lot of community interest uh, in the event that uh, precipitated the board uh, actions by the previous supervisor. And it's serious enough that I believe the county should take the lead to try to address this issue. And so I'd like to add um, additional direction to this item. The first um, additional direction would be to direct staff to send the attached resolution to our state legislative representatives. And then the second action would be to direct staff to prepare an ordinance for the board's consideration within two months that would prevent private transfer companies from physical contact with minors 
in the same manner that our county policies prevent child protective service workers from touching minors. Uh, this ordinance would apply, and that's that's the end of the direction, but this ordinance would apply in the unincorporated parts of the county. And we understand we want to have alignment with the cities. And I think that um, should this ordinance be something that we can implement, we would want to encourage the cities as well to take similar approaches. Um, our county has policies that prevent workers from physically touching minors. And I think that private businesses that do that same kind of work with children should be held to the same standards. So um, I'm hoping we can add that direction that we get support for that direction as well. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. I'll mention a couple of quick items on 25, the digital wallet project. Uh, appreciation for Ms. Benson and the team that's been working on it. Obviously, it hasn't been quite as quick as I think the county was hoping for, but it does appear as though we're getting it right. And I think that that's more important uh, than expediting. On item 31, also appreciation for ISD on the broadband master plan. This is an item that um, I brought forward sometime forward to use funding for a number of things and to have the CPUC provide funding for this broadband master plan, which really one of the key components is this qualifies us for a significant amount of state and federal funding for broadband expansion throughout our county. Uh, I look forward to working with ISD and I encourage my colleagues to do the same to ensure that we get the word out about the surveys and the work that they're doing so we can find where those holes are so that when we're doing this master plan, it allows us to get funding for those specific uh, targeted locations. On uh, item 30, nine, which is the emergency communications. I appreciate the uh, support of my colleagues. The idea here was just to have something that had a lower barrier to entry than the reverse 911 system that we've been using. Uh, there's a lot of things we need to communicate with the world on and, and it, even just uh, some of the most uh, recent traffic related issues that we've had are road closures. I mean, the barrier to entry can be very low. You can geolocate on some of these emergency communications devices. So I think that uh, Supervisor Hernandez's suggestions are very good. And as part of the process that I'm sure the CEO's office will look at, they'll look at what other people are using within the county to see if there could be the option of alignment. It's very cost effective. People expect to be able to passively receive information from uh, their local government. And this provides us an opportunity for people to self-select into that opportunity. Uh, the last item is just on the storms. I'll also add that appreciation and also uh, make sure that people recognize in the community that if you suffer damage, either in your, your home or business, to be sure to reach out to us uh, or to your state or federal representatives to ensure that you are actually getting access to all the resources that you need. There's a lot of things that actually go unclaimed during a process like this. A lot of people don't know that they qualify uh, for a lot of loans or other opportunities. We've had a number of conversations with constituents in our district that people didn't realize something had the possibility of being reimbursable. Uh, so make sure that it, we, we want to use these services. And also we don't have a whole lot of time. I mean, um, ultimately these applications need to get into the next couple of months uh, to our state or federal partners. So make sure that you do reach out and avail yourself of that. All right, so we do have a request for additional direction. Um, if there are no other comments, it now would be appropriate time for board member to make a motion on consent with the additional direction. Okay. Uh, Second. So we have a motion for consent with the additional direction on item 63 from Supervisor Cummings. Uh, you may need to provide that specifically to the clerk with the exact language as we have a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Friend? Aye. Consented it and passes unanimously as amended with additional direction. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, we're going to move on to the first item of our regular agenda, which is item number seven, which is to consider authorizing the issuance of a proclamation honoring Agricultural Commissioner Juan Hidalgo on the occasion of his departure from the County of Santa Cruz to be signed by all members of the board and outlined in a memo of the chair. Uh, good morning, Mr. Commissioner. Um, we are we are very sad to see you go. We must say I will make some uh, brief introductory comments, um, as I believe the supervisor that's worked most closely with you because I have more agricultural land in my district than anyone else. And uh, let me just say a few things about Juan that I don't. That this is one of those members that maybe a lot of members of the community may not know, but you, in my opinion, epitomize the best about what an agricultural commissioner across the state would be. And you have been recognized as a leader throughout the state uh, in your association, which uh, I had the good fortune of being able to speak to a few years ago. 
But you've been able to find this balance between the regulation side, the education side, and being a really progressive leader within your field. Santa Cruz County can be a challenging place. Uh, the interface between agriculture and schools, between agriculture and business, between agriculture and just the general sense of life, the, the ever-changing state and federal regulations, and uh and uh, as far as growers needs and also the challenges of regulations and you've been able to find this balance uh, where everybody feels like they've been heard we've been able to move policies forward in a very progressive and positive way you're a member of our community it shows um when i i heard of your departure although i know you're not leaving very far uh down to monterey county um it was you know it was a tough one because i just have seen the amazing work that you've done throughout the south county and i appreciate everything you've done um are there any other supervisors who'd like to make comments before we open it up to Mr. Hidalgo? And also, uh, I'll open it up for Mr. Palacios as well. Supervisor Cohen. Sure. Commissioner Hidalgo, I just want to uh, acknowledge one specific example of the, the kind of work that Chair Friend mentioned, which is um, you know uh, helping get our county as part of a pilot pesticide notification program. I know that means a lot to uh, people, particularly who are who live close to those fields. Um, you know, of course, agriculture is one of the two main engines of our economy here in Santa Cruz County. I always appreciate your your thorough reports. I think I first encountered one as part of the Focus Ag program, which uh, if, if, to my fellow supervisors, if you haven't done yet, I highly recommend you take that program. Um, but I mean, $657 million worth of, of crops in our county in 2021, the last, the last complete report. I mean, that's incredible. Um, and of course, it's steadily risen under your leadership as our ag commissioner. Um, I also point out to people, you know, I think Juan's name appears more times in our county than anyone else's. If you if you look at every scale at every supermarket or, or every gas pump, he's there making sure that you're getting a square deal uh, on all those products that need to be weighed. So thank you for your work. We're really going to miss you. Okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, we uh, we are very fortunate, in Santa Cruz County. I think to have the best of the best of 58 counties in California as, as to have you as our ag commissioner. And uh, all the applauded school, um, I, I, you know, I, you could go on and on of what you've done. And, you know, with what you've engaged the youth to, to realize the value of, of nutritional foods and so forth and, you know, what they can do and to start young. And that's what's going to make the difference in the long run, literally. So I, uh, there's so many aspects of the, what you've done for the agricultural community for this county uh, that, um, that have been mentioned and they could go on and on. But uh, you are the best of the best. And uh, Santa Clara County is very, very fortunate to have you as their ag commissioner in the near future. We've really appreciated having you here for as many years as you've been here. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Cummings? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I'm Sadly, I haven't had an opportunity to work with you um, just now getting on the board and with your departure. But I just want to uh, thank you for your service to Santa Cruz County. Um, obviously, you've done a great job, as has been expressed by many of our board members, as reflected in our community. And just want to thank you for all your hard work and wish you the best in your next endeavor. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. So we ha haven't had the opportunity to work with you as a Santa Cruz County supervisor, but we've worked a lot on as a uh, city council member. And I want to thank you for helping me gu uh, guide me and navigating through a lot of uh, issues that we've had. Um, you know, you, I really appreciate all your advice, suggestions, and really leading us in the right direction in South County. Um, I think that, like Zach Friend said, you know, I think that you're this awesome balance of uh, progressive vision and making sure that we have prosperity in South County as well. So I think, you know, keep up that bold vision of, of being progressive and in, in making sure that we're prosperous in our community, in our communities. And I'm still going to give you a call once in a while to ask for that advice. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. And by the way, before I turn it over to Mr. Palacios, if Supervisor Caput were here, he would thank you for making sure the peanut butter has the right weight in it. Um, <laughs> every year, he was fascinated about his peanut butter jar and whether somebody was actually making sure and Juan assured him he's there for you on the peanut butter. Um, CAO Palacios. Yes, thank you uh, very much, Chair Friend. Uh, Juan, I want to thank you for your years of service. Um, you command a lot of respect in the industry, in the community, um, and among the advocates as well. And that's hard to do 
to get um, everyone on all sides to have a lot of respect for you. And you, you command the respect because of your integrity. Um, no one ever questions your integrity. You're fair to all sides. And as has been mentioned at the same time, you've been very progressive. So you've moved us forward as well. So I really do um, thank you for your years of service. Uh, we're gonna miss you. And I also want um, to wish you the very best as you drive to King City to your office over there. <laughs> All right, Mr. Hildago, please. Um, uh, good morning, Chair, uh, members of the Board of Supervisors, Juan Hidalgo, Agricultural Commissioner. I'm truly humbled by the very kind words here today. I uh, really have enjoyed uh, working with the county so many years. I've been here 18 years and I've had the privilege to serve as Agricultural Commissioner for, for the last several years. Um, and uh, it truly has been a, an honor to be able to serve our community, uh, you know, during challenging times as well as good times and to be able to provide for uh, support for our growers, make sure that they have the tools that uh, to succeed uh, for agriculture and also working with our communities and, and um, you know, working with my staff to to make sure that our services are there to support our communities. Um, it's certainly a fine balance uh, between the needs of agriculture in our communities here. And I'm, I'm grateful to all the folks, all the growers, all the community members that have come to me and have been willing to work with my office, with my staff and be able to collaborate and find some, some middle ground on some of the difficult issues that have come up over the, the last few years. Um, I wanna be, I'm truly grateful to your board and, and the CAO's office uh, for all the opportunities to allow me to excel, to become the leader I am today. Uh, I couldn't be here if it wasn't for how progressive our county is in uh, focusing on developing uh, leadership within the county. And uh, I'm truly grateful for that. And, you know, I'm just... Uh, so glad to have had the opportunity to work with so many fine individuals here in the county over the years to be able to, uh, at the end of the day, to be able to uh, support our communities and the county and, and be able to become better at what we do. So I'm truly grateful for for that. And, you know, I wouldn't be here and my success, uh, I wouldn't be as successful as I am if it wasn't for my staff. I'm truly grateful to my staff for their support. They have always been there for me. Uh, you know, they believe in what we do. They believe in our services. They believe in uh, what we do to better our community is essential work. And we were essential workers when the pandemic started. And it was a challenging time, but I'm truly grateful for my staff that they were there to uh, lead the way to recognize that we needed to provide services to our community. And, you know, there was no hesitation there. And I'm truly grateful for that. And um, you know, to my family, I'm I'm grateful uh, for their understanding, understanding their flexibility, um, always being there for me. Because uh, as you know, similar to your jobs, uh, this is not an eight to five job, and you know there's a lot of things that you have to miss out on and make some small sacrifices. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm I'm grateful to my family for being flexible and recognizing that at the end of the year, uh, day, you know, what we do is for a much bigger cost, right? And to me, supporting our community is, is right there at the top of those things. What it means to be a public servant is, you know, not just doing the job that we do to provide services to the community, but stepping out of, uh, uh, you know, those requirements uh, to support our community during challenging times, such as some of the disasters we have had, and certainly my staff has been incredible in, in providing and serving as disaster service workers, e either during the floods or the fires, and even during the pandemic when the county was setting up some of the shelters. Uh, and lastly, uh, you know, I just want to um, thank former Santa Cruz County Agricultural Commissioners for, uh, you know, leading the way, setting the example, believing in me and being the mentors that I had in the past that have allowed me to be where I, I am at this point in my career. Um, and certainly truly grateful uh, to growers in our community for giving me the opportunity to serve as Agricultural Commissioner all these years. And I am going to miss working with 
my county family here with my staff, with my colleagues. Uh, it's It's been wonderful working here. I learned a lot and, and I hope I can carry what I what I've learned here in Santa Cruz County uh, to my new job in, in Monterey County. And I'm truly grateful for all the opportunities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Juan. Is there any... This is an action item. So is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? Very quickly, Elisa Benson, Assistant CAO, and I've had the incredible honor of working very closely with Juan over the last year and a half. And just from the administrator side of the, the, the house, Juan demonstrates, he models exceptional public sector leadership and then set an example for his staff and all of, all of his colleagues to learn from and, and emulate. Not only does Juan have extensive technical knowledge and experience that crosses all the dimensions of his department, he brings administrative management skills, budget, personnel, state relations that is exceptional. But beyond, beyond all that, and I think everyone has touched on it, is that openness, that integrity, and that, in, that fairness in everything he does. Um, he actively engages with internal and external stakeholders. And I, I can tell you whether he has to take a hard stand as a regulator as, or as a boss. I've heard from many, many people that he uh, comes to those decisions from a place of respect, fairness, thoughtfulness, and transparency. And this was from folks, even if they didn't like the decision, they appreciated what he brought to it and how he shared. Um, Monterey County is getting an uh, outstanding leader and public servant. We're gonna miss you. But your investment in your team and your department leaves them well prepared to continue your ethic of service and the model you've made for all of us, Bravo One. We wish you well. Uh, Madam Clark, is there anybody on Zoom? Yes, we do have a speaker online. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, I remember when Juan came to the county, definitely a nice person. However, working in a system of uh, pesticide poisoning, I taught many years in Watsonville next to fields of pesticides. My health provider says that's why I have an essential tremor. We formed a group that needs to be the model, farm without harm, farm without harm, that supports ecological and organic agriculture without the use of pesticides. Regulation, oh, doesn't that sound good? Regulation, what does that mean? Regulation is a system of permitting and perpetuating corporate harm, in this case from pesticide corporations. Prohibition prevents poisoning. Many times I had to take my classroom children at a messy school in Watsonville inside the classroom as they were coughing from spraying next from the adjacent fields. You talk about nutritious food. Nutritious food is food without poisons on them. We need to prohibit this poisoning of agriculture. And it's horrific that babies, the umbilical cords of babies, have something like 200 chemicals in them, um, you know, that, that weren't there before World War II. Anyway. Thank you, Ms. Um, is there anybody else online? Yes. Carolyn, your microphone is now available. Thank you. This is Carolyn Farrell, and I addressed the meeting a few months ago regarding the transport companies in Santa Cruz. And I want to 
thank you um, and specifically Supervisor Cummings for. Ma'am, ma we've already voted on that item, but uh, we appreciate that you. Can I just, just say thank you very you, much for voting on that? Thank you. Thank you for calling in on that. Is there anybody else on for Mr. Hildago? Paz, your microphone's now available. Thank you. Good morning, all. This is Paz Padilla, Impact and Program Director for Community Action Board. One, uh, we just want to say thank you for your collaboration with Community Action Board. I was able to be part of your team when COVID-19 hit. I was amazed on how you just brought nonprofits together and helped those individuals in, our, in, in the farm fields when they were working and nobody was reaching out to them. I was really impressed the way you just got us all together. We're really going to miss you. Uh, Monterey is very lucky to have you. Y te deseo todo, todo lo mejor y buena suerte, Juan. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Anybody else, Madam Clerk? We have no further speakers, Chair. Was there anybody else in chambers? I want to make sure that... Good morning. My name is James Hewing Whitman. Um, I think that what Miss Marilyn Garrett, a speaker on Zoom, spoke about was her actual experience having a career in this county with how pesticides actually affected the children around her. So I want to thank her for doing what she did. Obviously, I would have liked to have been here on time, but that's the way it is. So there is a big difference between live soil and live food. And a lot of times, many pesticides don't create live food and live soil. And there's a big difference between the two. So I know nothing about this gentleman, except he's been, I think from what I read, in charge of uh, public weights and measures for the past eight years. So there's just a criteria that um, could also be looked at. And that really has to do with whether we're producing something that creates health or other things that create poor health. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Seeing none, we'll close the public comment component of it. This is an action item. We would need a motion for the proclamation. Chair, I move that we issue a proclamation honoring Agricultural Commissioner Juan Hidalgo. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig, a second from Supervisor Hernandez. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? And Chair Friend? Aye. Adam Congratulations. All right, thank you. We'll move on to item eight, which is to consider an update on county strategic initiatives, including the third biannual progress report in the 21 to 23 operational plan, the status of the 23 to 25 operational plan and budget, the development of a countywide equity framework and targeted performance improvements for spring of 2023, and direct the CAO, uh, the county administrative office, excuse me, to return on or before August 22nd, 2023 with the next update as outlined in the memo of the CAO. For this, we have Elisa Benson, the Assistant CAO. We have Nicole Coburn, the Assistant CAO. We have Sven Stafford, the Principal Administrative Analyst in CAO's Office, and Irma Marquez, the HSD Social Services Division Director. All right. Oh, Good morning. Ms. Coburn, please. I'll kick us off this morning, uh, Chair Friend and members of the board. Um, it's a pleasure to be back with you to talk about our strategic initiatives. Um, I'm joined today by Elisa Benson, the other Assistant CAO, Sven Stafford, um, our principal analyst in the CAO's office, and Deputy Director Irma Marquez from the Human Services Employment and Benefit Services Division. Uh, and I'm Nicole Coburn, Assistant CAO. So let's turn to our agenda for the presentation this morning. Um, for the rest of this morning, we're going to 
provide brief updates on the current operational plan. Um, we're in the third progress report for that plan. We're also going to be talking about developing the new uh, operational plan for the years 2023 through 2025. And then we'll turn to the creation of our countywide equity framework. Uh, while these efforts are today's focus, I did wanna just mention that our work continues on performance measurement and continuous process improvement, which we're integrating into a comprehensive performance management initiative. And we'll come back at a future board meeting to talk more about that. So to give you a little bit of an overview of our strategic initiatives, particularly for our new board members, um, the county strategic plan was um, adopted in June of 2018. It covers a six year period for 2018 through 2024. Uh, continuous improvement was a pillar of that plan and the county developed street, three strategic initiatives to embed a plan, do, study, adjust learning cycle across the county. The plan and do phases, which you can see in this diagram, are represented through the county strategic plan, our operational plan, and our county budget. They articulate the county focus areas and goals, create specific measurable objectives, and align county resources and staff to achieve results. The study and adjust phases are represented through our performance management, program and they create data, spark curiosity and provide tools to target and improve our work to get the best results for our community. Since the adoption of our strategic plan in 2018, the county has moved to embed equity principles across the entire cycle. And that's why you see it at the center of this diagram. Elisa Benson is going to be talking a little bit later about that in more detail. These initiatives are a way of framing real work that's being done in the community <clears throat> and improving and accelerating that work um, that departments are doing to make an even bigger impact. So now I'm gonna invite Director Marquez to share a story about a human services objective related to immigrant food security. This is one of 180 objectives in the current plan and she'll talk about the impact that that objective is making. Good morning, Chairman Friend, members of the board, Mr. Palacios, members of the community. My name is Irma Marquez, Division Director over Employment and Benefit Services of the Human Services Department. Today, I wanna to talk to you about the positive effect of CalFresh benefits on participants and community. What, is, what are CalFresh benefits? At the federal level, this is known as SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. In the state of California, we know it as CalFresh, formerly known as food stamps. It is a federal mandated program for California. Um, it is state supervised and county operated. CalFresh improves the nutrition of low-income households by increasing their food buying power. And this food buying power has a cascading effect throughout the economy. When recipients spend their CalFresh money, that spending generates income for the people who produce, transport, market, and sell the food that those dollars purchase. I want to share with you a snippet of the life story of the Garcia family. The Garcia family is made up of Aurora, a non-citizen single mom with two U.S.-born children. This household composition is known as a mixed status household in public assistance language. Due to Aurora's non-citizen status, this is she is not eligible to CalFresh benefits, but her two U.S. born ch children are. Aurora and her family were impacted by the recent storms, and she was not able to work for two weeks. If it weren't for the CalFresh benefits, we would not have food, said Aurora. The former president and his administration proposed policies, changes to immigration policies, which generated fear in immigrant families, and force families like the Garcias to make an impossible choice between meeting their basic needs for healthcare, food and shelter, or face future possible deportation. In Santa Cruz County, many immigrant families disenrolled from CalFresh benefits, believing that benefits issued to their US born children could prevent them from attaining their own legal residency status, which is not true. Our partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank and the Community Action Board Thriving Immigrants Collaborative helps educate, engage, and assist our community with completing CalFresh applications that are 
eligibility staff then process and issue benefits for. The collective impact that our partnership has on the community we serve helps make sure that families are getting the nutrition benefits they are entitled to while help helping increase trust in government. In Santa Cruz County, between January 2020 and December 2022, there were 2,088 CalFresh cases or households with an undocumented parent and a U.S. born child. We set a goal to increase enrollments of U.S. born children to immigrant households. And in July 2021, the number of CalFresh children in mixed immigration household status was 2,624. And by November 2022, we had 3,710 children enrolled in CalFresh benefits. This is a difference of 1,076 children. One in every six children in California have an immigrant parent. And when 38,000 Santa Cruz County residents receive CalFresh and only 10% of 10% are children with non-citizen parents, you know there is more work to be done. Continued partnerships like the ones we have with Second Harvest Food Bank and CAB's Thriving Immigrant Collaborative is essential to securing the family's access to nutrition benefits. There are many studies that touch on food insecurity across America. And one thing that everyone can agree on is that consistent access to nutritious food is fundamental to health and well-being. And as my late grandmother would say, pancita llena, corazón contento, full tummy, happy heart. Thank you. I would like to turn it over to Mr. Stafford. Thank you, Director Marquez. Back to the power. Um, and good morning, board. Uh, the food security objective is a good reminder that when we mark these objectives complete, it's not the end of the story. Uh, and it's really a completed objective means hopefully that a system or program is better than it was and plays some part in achieving the county vision of a healthy, safe, more affordable community. Uh, ensuring children get the food they're entitled to is one of those contributions. Uh, as you can see, we've completed 42% or about 75 small contributions that are building uh, towards that county vision. Uh, as another example, the board took another small step in December uh, towards becoming a more affordable community by adopting the sustainability update uh, to the general plan. Uh, currently, we expect another 52% of the current batch of objectives to be complete by June of this year. Uh, and so I'd like to take a, a brief tour of the operational plan website, uh, which does reflect the current status of the operational plan. As you can see here, uh, you get our general statistics that we have 180 total objectives, uh, 75 of which are completed, uh, and the rest are either amended and or in progress. Uh, and I just like to bring attention that we can sort these objectives in various ways. Uh, by their completion status. So you can see all the completed objectives in one place or in progress. Uh, you can see all the objectives by the timeline that they're supposed to be completed. Uh, you can sort them by department and you can even sort them by collaborating department if you want to see, for example, how some of our internal service departments help uh, you know, help align and, and collaborate on the work of all of our uh, client facing departments. Finally, you can also group them by our different focus areas for the 21-23 plan, including um, objectives that have an equity lens, our COVID-19 recovery and fire recovery objectives. Uh, this morning, I'd just like to take a little time to focus on an OR3 objective, our Office of Reco Response, Recovery, and Resilience. Uh, as the board is aware, the, uh, um, the OR3 uh, did a, a really big amount of work to bring the climate action and adaptation strategy to the board. Uh, for all completed objectives, we do provide a verification link and our documentation. Uh, for this one, we've linked to the really um, neat story map that OR3 put together. I'd just like to take one second to, um, to scroll through this because I think, um, one, that it's pretty cool, uh, that it tells, tells a story. It does 
some education about how we got to where we are um, that's worth scrolling through. We also have uh, over here on our emissions inventory uh, data on emissions and what we need to target to be uh, successfully contributing locally to reducing our greenhouse emissions. Uh, so here you can see it by sector. Uh, and as was noted in the presentation in December, transportation is the overwhelming uh, contributor to our emissions. Uh, and finally, it provides a set of strategies um, that, uh, that are cross-sectoral and hold us accountable, but are really focused on creating uh, the behavior change that will hopefully allow us to thrive long into the future. We can go back to the presentation. Thank you, clerk. Yeah. Uh, for the 2023 to 25 plan, um, climate action objectives will be a major, major theme. Um, and so taking those strategies and turning them into targeted measurable steps towards resilience. Uh, the other focus of the plan will be on housing and the interrelation of the two um, as we try to become more resilient and more affordable. When we last came to the board uh, in September, we talked about improving the process to be more inclusive, measured, and targeted. To achieve this since September, we've activated five teams within our community development and infrastructure, both on the planning and public work side, within health services, the personnel department, and general services. Um, all five departments were ones that we felt were critical to meeting our goals for this process. Uh, those teams have turned around and reached out and included over 600 county staff in the process. Additionally, CAO staff have done over 20 presentations to county commissions and advisory bodies. And we've also worked with uh, every department to provide training so that over 25% of county staff will have been involved some way in developing objectives for this plan. Uh, all that work, we hope, will result in 90% of our objectives meeting standard. Uh, and that is to be a smarty, which is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound, inclusive, and equitable. And to hear more about how we're thinking of equity, not just at an objective level, but at a countywide level, I'll turn it over to Assistant County Administrative Officer, Elisa Benson. Thank you, Sven. Uh, good morning, board members. Elisa Benson, Assistant CAO, and I want to thank Nicole and Irma for, for putting forward the, the front part of the conversation. Um, in my uh, section, talking about our county equity framework, I'm going to talk about what what's been going on, what's, what's, what's the ongoing and the old work, and what is new and how what we're gonna be introducing to you today is new, different, and critical. I'll also do the wrap up of the briefing today and then we'll, we are excited to have conversation with you and hear your questions and input. So with that, I wanna talk about what's going on today. And so I wanna go back to that opening slide where we have that equity in the, in the center. So what does this mean? We have definitely been doing equity-oriented work over the last five years. As you heard from Sven and Irma, we have integrated that. It's You see words and focus on it in our strategic plan language. You see it in our 80 of 180 uh, operational objectives for the last period, two-year period. 80 of those are equity-oriented uh, objectives. And then I wanna talk a little bit about some of the other pieces of that have been out there over the last five years. Uh, we have the the resolution that you all adopted in, I'm gonna gotta get this right, August of 2018 on August 8, no, August of 2020 on August 18th, remember that day? Uh, where you adopted a resolution declaring racism as, racism as a public health crisis and put a number of actions into motion. You also established an ad hoc advisory committee um, to provide perspective from brown, black, and indigenous community people around their experience around the county and the county's work. And we have been, that is now a group that is, that reinvented and renamed themselves as, as the Circle on Anti-Racism and Economic Justice. We call it CARES Justice. And we have been in conversation with them for the last two years 
learning about how to just even talk about issues of equity. We also, as I mentioned, have those 80 equity objectives that span all our departments. And some are heavy leans into deep equity issues and some are light. So we really have a lot going on. We have um, what you just adopted with the CAP in December, your equity guardrails about recognizing as we come up with our actionable steps around adaptation and mitigation, we have to consider equity lenses. So we have a lot going on. We have probation who has been a national leader working with Annie Casey Foundation and their results count framework, looking very deeply at questions of equity and racial equity in particular, and in, in their part of the system. So a lot of work is underway, but what isn't there is a countywide unifying framework. And we've heard from our partners, uh, our operating partners in departments saying, we need help plugging this all together. So that's what brings us to um, our objective 196, creating an equity framework. And that is something that sits within the, uh, the county administrative office, but it is absolutely in part partnership with you, with our operating departments and with community. So I'd like to go to the next slide. And what we have here is what we are sort of starting as our opening framework around how do we actually create something that we can unify all those diverse activities across departments and quite frankly with our community department community partners first thing we need to come back to an actual definition of equity um, we use the word a lot and i think people all have different meanings and this is where and we can we can utilize the work of many other organizations across the state, across the country who have been leaning into this work. But that, that definition has to be locally grounded. So we wanna have that definition. We wanna have a vision of equity. What are we striving for to really drive that hard effort? And this will be a hard effort. Um, and we need to have tools and be accountable. And so what you see at the bottom of this page is sort of buckets of how we work organizationally and how are we bringing equity lenses into each of those buckets that we have and we have to do that very explicitly. So here's just, this is, you know, what you get from us a lot, an analytical framework, how we're going to start talking about things. We also recognize that as the second largest employer in the county and a major is institution with a long legacy we bring just walking into the room, we bring a certain presence and that we have to have these conversations with a lot of other people who have a different perspective. And to do that, we are we're highly in, highly aware of that, um, those diff power differentials and those dynamics. We want to work closely to create environments where people can have comfortable and meaningful, well, maybe not comfortable, not comfortable, hard conversations about their experiences so we all can be better informed. So to do that, we have an internal group because we need to do this with our staff and employees because we all need to be part of this. And we, uh, Sun and myself, are sort of at the core of that within our office. And we've invited Megan Riley, who is our new deputy director from general services, and Mitsuno Baumeister, who is with the personnel department. Both have experience outside of our county looking at issues of equity. Megan uh, in LA County Unified Schools and Mitsuno in, I'm going to get the name of the transit agency wrong in Santa Clara. The transit agency in Santa Clara that I don't that, well, so she looking at look at again at an internal and external focused um, equity. So we want to bring more voices and experiences as we craft our internal process for this. And then on the community side of it, we are really leaning on the work of the last two years with our CARES Justice Group to help construct a working group with community voices to help us work on those, those definitions and visions of equity. And the third part, as I think we've referenced in the letter, is meeting with all of you before we launch this process in the spring to get your perspective on this work, what we're doing well, where we have gaps, um, voices that maybe we're not, we're not thinking through. So you can absolutely, we, we are relying on your participation moving forward as we 
jump into this next part of the work. Um, with that, uh, I want to, um, I'm going to move actually to closing unless we want to talk about this. I'm going to move to the closing and then we'll be open for, for questions. So with that, uh, we will be finalizing the 23-25 um, operational objectives for present in February and March. Um, working with our with those adaptive assistant teams and in all our departments, on the equity framework side, we'll be finalizing the design for the rollout of what we know will be a flexible and adaptive conversation, uh, and, and we'll be meeting with you all in February and then roll out that work in March and April. The budget and the operational plan objectives will be coming forward to you. It'll be. Uh, rolled out to the public in late April, early May, and then we will have you know, quite a bunch bit of uh, time with you all for your consideration of those. And then we will be bringing back the countywide equity framework to you in June for your consideration to drive the work moving forward. With that, we are excited about moving forward and a little nervous, but it's it's good. And uh, we look forward to hearing your feedback and your your questions. Thank you, Ms. Benson. Are there any questions or comments from board members on this item? Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, just I mean, want to commend the entire team for your work on this. I mean, having these very incremental and measurable objectives through every county department is really helpful. Of course, we don't, we don't have to do this, right? I mean, it's so much extra commitment, I think, by every member of this organization to really be the best that we can be. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I feel like the integration with the county budget last year and of course going forward. Um, and I think also one of my favorite pieces of this is the uh, permit center dashboard. I mean, the, these dashboards, which of course also go across uh, probation, treatment, intervention, substance use disorder services, and really provide real time data for us and for the public uh, as far as how effective we, we are at delivering county services. Uh, my question is, in the development of the 23-25 operational goals, um, are, have we put out like a survey to employees? And so often, I mean, this whole theory of operational improvement, uh, Kaizen, uh, as it's called, the, the, you know, the theory that we can be always striving for excellence, um, which originally came out of Japan. I mean, it's all about the people who are closest to the work suggesting, uh, you know, ways that we can improve things maybe they're doing that are wasting time or things they see that could be done better. Have we put out a you know employee surveys within departments asking for suggestions for these specific uh, operational improvements? Supervisor Koenig, we haven't done a survey, but what's unique in the development of the new two-year plan has been the adaptive assistance teams that Sven Stafford mentioned. They're bringing together staff at various levels of the organization, particularly staff who are close to the work, to identify data, to develop measures and objectives um, that are much more specific and um, um, you know, aggressive. So I, Sven would be happy to speak more to those teams, but I think it's been very effective at drilling into the work and getting close to what you're speaking to. Um, yeah, I mean, I just add that, uh, I think, you know, we can do, we can certainly do a general survey. And I think when we reach out in a targeted fashion, that's related to, to staff's work and, and engage them in, in that way that, um, that it's more effective in terms of producing hopefully organizational change. And I think some of the changes that we're thinking about for, um, taking what we've learned over the last six months with these teams and trying to apply it uh, to the to the process improvement side of um, side of this uh, plan to study adjust cycle uh, will hopefully um, you know drive that inclusion. Uh, great, great. Thanks. Looking forward to seeing some of those recommended objectives. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, when when I look um, at how much progress this county has made uh, since um, setting and meeting the strategic goals since uh, 2018, I really see a lot of increase 
and efficiencies and transparencies and transparencies and and really overall uh, government services that continue to be improved year after year. And I want to thank our CAO Carlos Palacios for getting us on track and let's move forward. And all the current county departments and employees who've been engaged in this and making the public inclusive of it too. Uh, that's been a key factor, I think. Um, I hope the community spa uh, pays uh, special attention now to uh, this work because we are making the real commitments to make our county services more uh, measurable and the outcomes uh, more transparent. If you want a roadmap of what the county wants to do and where it's going in these next two, 23, 25 years, uh, 2023, 25, take a look at this. This is what our target is and this is where we want to go. And it's really good to see that we've accomplished some of our tasks. We don't want to get too comfortable with all of that. There's a lot more to do, and we know that. Um, and I think the focus for the 2023-25 on climate change and resiliency is especially um, relevant and, and timely, given that we appear to be uh, you know, uh, dealing with one climate-related disaster after another. And I think the approval of our climate action and ad adaptability plan or cap and our sustainability plan at the end of last year puts us on in a framework of where we want to go and where we're, what we want to do in the future. So by linking uh, the new objectives of the next two years with department budget proposals, um, we're helping ourselves to really plan better, uh, to be more efficient with our resources and increase our productivity to meet the goals and be transparent with the public of what, what our targets are and where we want to go in the future. This is the place to look for the basis of our overall plan for the next two years. And I think you've done a phenomenal job of inclusiveness and transparency. And um, I think uh, this is way ahead of the game from the other counties in the state, I think. And uh, you're to be commended for the work you've done. And uh, I look forward to implementing as many plans as we can in the near future. And, and congratulations on the success for the accomplishments that we've made to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson, Supervisor Cummings. I just want to appreciate all the work that's been going into this planning process and being new to the county's plan. I'm looking forward to learning more and working with you all uh, moving forward. And just want to let you know that um, that I'm more, I know you mentioned you're going to be reaching out to us and community members and um, having some experience working with diversity, equity, inclusion programs. Look forward to working with you all as this plan continues to be developed. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. I really appreciate appreciate the presentation, and you know I think it's really timely that uh, we can apply a lot of this for the uh, South County centers, both the Health Center and the uh, West Marine. It's going to be really applicable uh, for the expanded services and equity, and so I really appreciate all your guys' work on this. So thank you. All right, thank you. I just want to open it up for the community. Is there any member of the community that would like to address this on this item? Please. Mm -hmm. Good morning, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I'm glad that I was present to be a witness here. I took some interesting notes. I wanna say a mistake does not become an error unless you refuse to correct it. Um, it's not my fault that I have a geology degree and cultural and physical anthropology degrees more than 30 years ago, but there's perspectives here that just don't seem to be talked about. And since several people, individuals, have mentioned uh, actual community involvement, why don't we start with education? So don't believe a word I say, but there are people that have taken the time, for example, and I'm referring to Ransom Godwin in an interview with David Devine, where they added up all the CO2 of all the nations on the, in the world, and that's 196 nations. And I believe they came up with 60 million metric tons of CO2. But the comparison was made that natural volcanology on this planet produces 15 times that amount. So if we use that degree of scale to all of the measures that are going on to reduce carbon, it does nothing It does nothing compared to what the planet is already producing every year. But uh, it's my understanding that human beings are 17% carbon. And if we go back in time, let's just go 65 million years ago, I think right now it's 0.1% CO2 makes up our atmosphere. And I don't know how they did the test 65 million years ago, but it was 2% CO2. And that plant, plants flourished 
And if you date the, the, the coal on the planet, one of the times is 65 million years ago. So I know that I'm probably disagreeing with everybody in this room. It's not my fault that professionally the past 38 years, I've been an auto mechanic or a contractor. I don't normally talk to human beings as much, but obviously I've been here a lot the last four years. So I am actually hoping that these conversations are more open to public participation. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from Chambers? Welcome back. Thank you. Hello. Well, um, sorry. Welcome back. <laughs> Hello again. Uh, for has here, Second Harvest Food Bank. Again, thank you so much for what a great presentation that was. Uh, speaking to that testimony of the fam uh, Garcia family, those are the families that we work with every day. And that is really what we're here to do and serve the community. Um, we are working as a food bank to figure out what other innovative and efficient ways we can do to get our outreach efforts out to the community. We know that there's still a gap. We know that there's still people out there that are of mixed um, families and folks that qualify, but there is a lot of myths and there's a lot of opportunities for education to be brought up so that people who need the service are utilizing the service and are not going hungry in our community. We thank again the community and we thank you the county for helping us and supporting us in our efforts to meet the needs and have, make sure that nobody goes hungry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? Madam Clerk online? Yes. Maria Elena, your microphone is available. Good morning again. This is Maria Elena de la Garza, the Executive Director to the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County. I'm also a member of the CARES Justice Circle, and so I just wanted to speak with that hat on. And first of all, thank our county partners, Elisa, Randy, Sven, our public, uh, our public health partners who have been part of the CARES Justice Circle, who was created over two years ago. And it's a group of consultants um, and activists uh, that, that support the county by providing expertise on these plans and these projects with an equity lens. We have um, come together for over two years to learn and try to understand how, what is our role and what is the best way we can move forward. Um, I want to invite each one of you as our board of supervisors to come in and to, to, to meet us. Um, it's been a bit, uh, uh, some of you we've met before, um, our new board of supervisors, we have not met um, in, in, that, in that space. And so I'd like to invite each one of you to come in and to meet this CARES Justice Circle, to learn about who we are and what we do and why we do it. Um, it is it is the essence of community engagement. And so I want to just share, um, you know, Gloria Nieto, who has, uh, who has left us last year, was part of this circle. We have our Black uh, 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 activist voices, Latino voices, Asian voices, LGBTQ voices, senior voices, Native American voices, and um, this this kind of group of expertise is really the, the, the best example of community engagement in partnership with the county. Sven has worked incredibly hard to pull us together, to, to be prepared for us when they pull us together so that we have information and we're giving um, our expertise on the county work. But we need you there too, Board of Soups. We need your input and we want to build stronger relationships with you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Call in user two. Your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, and thank you for that moving account of the Garcia family. Everyone has a right to food and a healthy environment and nutritious food. And I have a document here that I gave to former supervisor Tony Campos from Watsonville, dated 2009. And the food supply, a lot of problems with uh, food health access, et cetera. It's titled Bees, Birds, and Mankind, Destroying Nature by Electrosmog by Ulrich Warnke, Effects of Wireless Communication Technologies, which you are pushing massively, and it's destroying the environment. 
here's the summary. For many decades, research results shows showing that the natural electrical and magnetic fields and their variation are a vital precondition for the orientation and navigation of a whole range of animals has been freely available. What has also been known to science for many decades is that we humans depend upon this natural environment for many of our vital functions. And by the way, so do the bees. The beekeepers you talk to are very worried about the decline of the bee population. Back to this document. Today, however, this natural information and functional system of humans, animals, and plants has been superimposed by an unprecedented dense and energetic Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Sorry, anybody else? Madam Clerk, online. Yes, we have Thank one you. more speaker. Pause. Your microphone is now available. Thank you. Again, buenos dias. Good morning, uh, supervisors. Uh, Mr. Carlos uh, Palacios, Happy New Year to all of you. Welcome, Mr. Hernandez and Mr. Cunning. So my name is Pastadilla, again, Community Action Board. I just want to give um, kudos and thank you for the collaboration with the county. Um, it's because of this collaboration that we were able to do 28 food distributions, reaching out to 988 people. We did 11 events or tablings for reaching out to 598 individuals. We did 29 candidacy areas, reaching out to 4,840 individuals in our county. We did eight canvases, reaching out, reaching out to 653 individuals and one presentation via Zoom out to 40 people. Uh, we will continue advocating um, for the needs. We will keep on looking for those gaps. Our hopes is that we continue collaborating with the county as we see more and more needs throughout the year. But it's because of this collaboration that I do work, that I feel that we're doing a really good job within the whole entire county. So I'm really looking forward to continue our collaboration, advocating for the needs of our community in the entire um, Santa Cruz County. And I'm looking forward for 2023 year and more to come. So muchas gracias y seguimos en la lucha. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you. I'm gonna bring it back to the board for action. Let's make a very brief comment that uh, this is obviously goes well beyond, I think what any of us would have envisioned we would have had on this a few years ago when we first brought this forward. Um, we do need to ensure that we do uh, an even better job in trying that the community is aware of it and engaged in it because I mean, it doesn't do any good to have Sven spending this much time on it and not have the world engaging in the work that the county is doing. So we really do have to, I think, uh, ramp up the efforts to make sure that people know that they have access to this information. It makes it a much more uh, accessible and transparent government. Uh, do we have a motion for the recommended actions? I'll move the recommended actions. Second. A motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor McPherson. A roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Friend? Aye. Item passes. Thank you. Um, we do have a 1045 item, but it's we, I think we can get this item in, Ms. Hansen, um, which is item number nine, which is to consider a presentation on the sixth cycle housing element update. It's outlined in the memo of the deputy CAO. We have the memo and an update to the program, and we do have two people here with us today. We have uh, Ms. Stephanie Hansen, who's our assistant director of CDI, and Matthew Sun, who's one of our planners. Welcome to you both. Good to see you back. morning, board. Thank you. Uh, we're happy to return to the board today um, to present an overview of our um, housing element update. Um, with me today is uh, Matthew Sun, senior planner. He's uh, managing this project for us. He didn't have a chance to meet you last time we were here. And so with that, I will, we're going to try to make this brief. And um, I'll turn it over to Matthew to get us started. And we're both here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Morning, Chair and Supervisors. Today, we're going to update you on the sixth cycle housing home that is ended on this. Over to the Supervisors. Introduces. Thank you. 
in your staff report is the staff memo with attached housing element update program and schedule and staff recommendations. This presentation, this agenda item is for information purposes only, and so no action will be taken. I want to point out that although staff calls this the sixth cycle housing element, it can also be called the 2023 housing element. Thank you. General plan elements. And as you, can, as you can see, these are the various general plan elements of the County of Santa Cruz. The housing element is one of seven elements in the amended general plan and one of seven state mandated elements. The housing element is updated every eight years. The 2015 or the fifth cycle housing element was approved by the Board of Supervisors and certified by the California Department of Housing and Community Development in 2016. Several of the elements shown on this slide were updated in the sustainability update, which the board approved in December. The noise element was updated in recent amendments and the public safety element is undergoing separate update. And so updates of these and all other elements are not part of the housing element that we're currently going to go through. Goals for the housing element update. The goals include providing a range of housing choices, removing barriers to providing housing, preserving housing stock, and providing opportunities for special needs and supportive housing. Goal number two is to assist in the development of adequate housing to meet the needs of extremely low, very low, low and moderate income households. A new goal for the housing element is to focus future housing in areas with high resources the sixth goal is of paramount importance to the sixth cycle update and is meant to address inequities in zoning and access to resources and services that may not be available where lower income households have historically been located. High resources areas are those sites with the access to transit, schools, jobs, parks, and other services, also that do not require environmental mitigation and where permit streamlining or development incentives are available. Housing can still be built in low resource areas, but only if the county will incorporate policies and programs that are designed to remedy existing poverty conditions in low resource areas. Housing element update requirements. Presented here are the required actions associated with the housing element updates. First, the county must review the existing fifth cycle housing and inventory. This will require that staff conduct a thorough analysis of the existing approximately 1,000 plus properties included in the fifth cycle housing element. Properties that remain vacant may then be included in the sixth, thousand, sixth cycle housing element. Properties that were developed under, excuse me, during the fifth cycle will also be evaluated to determine if they are underdeveloped or underutilized and therefore a potential candidate for inclusion in the sixth cycle housing element. Staff will also identify properties that were overlooked or subsequently subdivided and therefore not included in the fifth cycle, but could be developed and therefore a potential candidate for the sixth cycle inventory. Housing and Community Development, HCD, requires that only sites with realistic demonstrated potential for development during the planning period be included. The inventory must identify current utility infrastructure and must specify number of units and income level of units that can be accommodated on the property. As to site eligibility to accommodate affordable housing, county staff must review density of projects on similarly zoned sites at similar affordability levels as indicators of affordable housing potential. With some exception, vacant sites that were identified in two or more previous planning periods and non-vacant sites identified in the previous planning period cannot be carried forward to the sixth cycle unless the sites will be rezoned to allow 20% low income affordable housing or existing zoning allows by right development for 20% low income affordable housing. This potentially could put constraints on how much capacity can be attributed to the existing inventory and may force the county to engage in rezoning to accommodate higher densities after the housing element is adopted. Our next slide here shows the fifth cycle RENA numbers as well as sixth cycle and the percent increase that were uh, subjected to, 353% increase. Next 
the next slide, affirmatively furthering fair housing. Affirmatively furthering fair housing or AFFH means taking meaning, meaningful actions in addition to combating discrimination that overcome patterns of segregation and fosters inclusive communities free from barriers that restrict access to opportunity. Note that the AFFH terminology is new to the sixth cycle or the 2023 housing element. The assessment of fair housing, state mandates an assessment of fair housing, which requires an analysis of the relationship between available sites and areas of high or low resources and concrete policies and programs to affirmatively further fair housing. The purpose of this assessment is to replace segregated living patterns with integrated and balanced living patterns and to, and to transform, transform racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty into areas of opportunity. The assessment of fair housing includes a summary of fair housing issues in the jurisdiction and an assessment of the jurisdiction's fair housing enforcement and outreach capacity and an analysis and summary of fair housing issues using available federal, state, and local data and local knowledge. <clears throat> the assessment of fair housing analysis must address integration and, and segregation. It must address racially or ethnically concentrated areas of property, of poverty, disparities in access to opportunity, including for persons with disabilities, and the analysis, the assessment of fair housing analysis must also address disproportionate housing needs, including displacement risk. Disproportionate housing may include overpayment, overcrowding, and housing conditions disproportionately affecting protected classes. Sustainability update and the climate action and adoption plan, adaptation plan. The sustainability update and climate action plan adopted in 2022 provide a basis for a lot of the work associated with the housing element update. These documents contain policies and strategies that support infill housing and various housing options in the context of a changing environment. Public involvement. As noted, public involvement has to be robust and begin to occur early in the process. It is important to note that at the October meeting, the Board of Supervisors expressed an interest in a deliberative and representative public engagement process where a panel of community members that represent the demographic diversity of the county is created and their recommendations incorporated in the housing element update. The policy group is aware of this board preference and is committed to working towards creating a panel. The policy section circulated a request for proposal in December to various consultants to assist the county in developing the deliberative and representational public engagement process that accommodates a community panel and a stakeholder group. <clears throat> Staff is putting together a list of potential stakeholders that will be used with for the well, that will be used by the consultant and the and the county to move forward with the robust public engagement. Our most colorful slide so far, the updated schedule. It's set in quarters, one, two, three, quarter four, and the beginning of 2024. <laughs> Basically, staff has the next six months to prepare a housing element and get it vetted by uh, internal staff and get it ready for a review by the Housing uh, Commission and the Planning Commission in July and the Board of Supervisors in August immediately goes to Housing and Community Development for their review. And the Housing and Community Development has two bites out of the apple and uh, will go from uh, our administrative draft to HCD. We'll get their comments and questions and respond to those and we'll come back to the Board of Supervisors for your adoption of the document. And then we send it back to HCD for another second review. <clears throat> so at this point, that concludes my presentations. Stephanie and I are available for any questions that you may have. Thank you for that excellent presentation. This is the non-action item. Are there questions from board members? Supervisor Koenig. Chair. Thank you, Chair. 
I just wanted to clarify that when it comes to these 4,634 units that we essentially need to add to uh, to our planning process, um, do I understand correctly, there's really two ways we could do it, right? I mean, we could rezone specific parcels to a higher density to allow you know, those additional units to be built, uh, or we can change rules that apply across the board. And if I remember correctly from the sustainability update, one of the most significant changes that we actually made was um, calculating the number of units that you could build based on uh, what net developable air area instead of gross or vice versa, thanks. Um, which just meant that more units could be built overall. So, I mean, as public's it, considering options and this board's considering options for uh, essentially meeting our uh, next cycle's housing goals. I mean, we can really look at both of those levers, right? That, that's right. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, most of the board will be uh, remembering not, not too long ago with the sustainability update, we made a lot of regulatory changes to our policies and codes and our general plan that would build more capacity. Um, and in fact, the uh, analysis for the sustainability update that we did for the EIR indicated a capacity of 4,500 additional units with those changes over 20 years. Um, so we'll definitely be building on those um, tools and that capacity that we already have and um, look to increase it a little bit more as we look at uh, the invent housing inventory uh, in this program. Um, and then one of the things I think that's really going to um, uh, make us look carefully at rezoning properties is the AFFH um, components and making sure that we have enough opportunities in our higher resource areas. Um, so that's that's not a so much a numbers game, right? Of just units, but where those opportunities ex exist. Um, so it'll definitely we'll be calling on all the tools we have in the toolbox to kind of um, uh, meet that uh, inventory need. Got it. So do you have a, a estimate yet of you know, basically how much the changes that we made from the sustainability update, like how many? units we could count from that towards our 4,534 yeah, I mean, goal? We, thank you. We did um, We did forecast 4,500 units. Um, the, the question really is a matter of timing. Um, that's a 20-year plan versus our requirements for the housing element and the RENA, um, which is to accommodate that work in eight years. Um, uh, so we'll be looking at the programs that are in the housing element to um, really assess whether we are um, facilitating and streamlining housing as much as we possibly can to kind of um, move that timeline into an eight year um, program. As you know, there's only so much that uh, the county can do, but we need to make sure we're doing everything that we can to help those opportunities actually develop. Okay, and I imagine that's something that HCD would give us feedback on as well. So if we say, hey, we did this sustainability update, it produces, we estimate 4,500 units over 20 years this is an eight year plan. So it's 40% of that. Uh, you know, we're gonna count that as 1,800 units in our plan. I, I mean, we could submit that to HCD and then they'll either say, yeah, that's realistic or no, you've got to build more room into this plan. I'm sure they'll be giving us uh giving us feedback, but the housing inventory um, that we provide as part of this housing element is a series of tables that show the calculations and the capacity, um, former development and the um, future opportunities. So they'll be able to see in the numbers. Great, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for this presentation. I really do appreciate it. I look forward to the public input, uh, the process going forward. Um, and has been mentioned in previous board meetings, uh, this is a huge, huge challenge for us. Uh, we all know that uh, to me, these revised arena numbers and the time frame may not be exactly eight years because um, we've had a tough time getting halfway there with the past eight years uh, in the county. And it, through no fault of anybody, it's just the way it is. And so uh, this is just something that is going to really uh, be 
uh, something we're going to have to work on uh, to pre preserve. I think you know, one of the things is neighbor neighborhood integrity. Um, and we have some limitations with previous measures that were passed by county voters that really inhibit our uh, ability to really expand very much. Um, and I, I'm so glad that we uh, passed the sustainability plan and the zoning changes that laid the groundwork for uh, supporting more housing. But there's some real geographic area, uh, transportation environmental challenges, not the least of which is water uh, and how with this growing population, how we're going to meet the needs, the water needs of our of our people here. I mean, our our we are known as the best conservation county uh, related to water in the state of California, and have been. I think our population has grown by uh, ten or twenty percent when our water needs have gone down by thirty or forty percent. Uh, we've re we've really reached some limits, I think, on what we can ask our citizens to do on conservation uh they're doing a fantastic job and they need to keep doing it how much more we can do with a growing population i'm not sure um and um i think that the state should be more of a partner with these with local governments to make sure we're building housing uh not just uh, give us unfunded mandates and requirements that are difficult to meet without such help uh, that said, we'll be working with on this issue. I know, I know you're doing everything you can, and this is what the state has put forward. But um, as we know, that lack of housing is a real problem for our labor force and our working families and our businesses and agencies here. But uh, to meet these goals is going to be one of the biggest challenges we have, certainly for the next eight years. But uh, I, uh, I hope we can get there. Uh, it's needed. There's no no question about that. But uh, it's going to be a tough, tough row to go. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I mostly have just comments to make. Um, I appreciate calling out the need for affordable housing production and just want to emphasize um, how we need to be explicitly and proactively focusing on affordable housing production as we're moving forward with this element, given that this is where we see the most critical need for housing in our community. Um, in addition to that, um, I think it's really important that we see increased uh, affordable housing programs policies in the element. And one thing that would be good to help understand is um, what types of units will be counted and how they will be counted. So in particular, with respect to ADUs, SB9 units, density bonus units, how those units will be uh, counted within the element. Um, I know at the city level, uh, ADUs, given that they were affordable by design, uh, will be counted in some of the moderate or lower income categories, but the reality is that a lot of those units are actually rented out for what's, you know, what would not be considered sometimes those groupings. And so I think it's just really important that uh, we have a clear understanding of how units are classified and that we're really emphasizing the production of affordable housing units. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, I also wanted to check in about the public involvement. Are we going to do that in-house or are we going to get consultants. I wanted to find out if we're going to do uh, targeted outreach for the Latino community and uh, if we're going to go out, you know, uh, do that in-house. Yeah, thank you. Um, as we were um, portraying in the presentation, um, public outreach is a very important part of this year's update. Um, the state requirements have changed on how you do it and how often you do it and when you do it. Um, so our um, our program includes kind of a two-pronged approach. Um, one of them is to create the uh, stakeholders group, um, which are those uh, folks and organizations that have um, different interests in housing development throughout the county, all kinds of housing development. Um, and then the second approach is to create that representative um, panel of um, community members and citizens who um, uh, kind of represent the, the breadth of um, the people that we have here in the county. So between those two um, efforts, um, we'll, be, we'll be looking at all the organizations that we need to reach out to. Um, and seeing how we can kind of um, both make sure we get the organization's input, um, but also those members of the community that they represent um, 
uh, as, as Matthew mentioned in the presentation, we did release an RFP. We will be using consultant help um, for that. We, we think there's um, good reason to have um, the county staff step back a little bit from that process so that people can feel um, comfortable that and in a safe environment that they are giving um, input that will be considered um, against all of the other input that we receive. So we'll be, we're uh, in the process of, uh, of selecting the consultant now, um, and we're going to rush into a uh, contract um, with them to get them started right away. And my second comment or suggestion would be is because we want to put, or the state outlines that we put affordable housing in places where there's high level of services. Um, I think we should really probably involve Metro in our discussions because we also want to make sure that we have high level of public transit access as well. So whether it's circulator buses or just more public access to buses, a bus line in the area. Uh, we, it, before I left council, we approved two, two uh, projects. One was a commercial project. One was a affordable housing project, but we made sure that we did more bike and pedestrian uh, infrastructure, but also a bus line, a new bus line with the bus turnout uh, in those projects. Uh, and I think our public works too, discussing it with our public works that we include, uh, you know, these projects that include more walkability and more bike and pedestrian infrastructure as well. Because if we have more people there and more um, housing, uh, without the bike and pedestrian infrastructure, we're gonna, it's gonna lead to more traffic violence. And so if, if we make it safe for everyone, for drivers and pedestrians and bicyclists alike, it makes it for uh, better for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, this is a non-action item. I'll, I'll just briefly say before I open it up to the community, um, it is interesting across the state to see these arena numbers. I mean, they're completely unrealistic. I mean, of what is being asked of communities to do. Um, and it'll, I think it'll be incumbent upon, because the goals are the same. I mean, we wanna see this amount of housing built. We wanna see affordable housing built. The timelines, the lack of funding, the expectations from the state are totally unreasonable and are gonna to lead to a lot of conflicts. And unfortunately, I think, um, unfortunately, a lot of uh, conflict directly with the state, but I think that that uh, we'll do what we can to to get through this process uh, together. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address this again? This is a non-action item before we move on to our 1045 scheduled item. Yeah, hello, my name is James Ewan Whitman. Uh, I appreciate being here for the comments here, particularly about, uh, Public involvement, what does actually public involvement mean? I'm not going to read what I wrote, but um, it is interesting that the public is being invited to uh, make comments and maybe some things that weren't included in this with, this is agenda item nine, the six cycle housing element update program. It's my understanding that 20% uh, of the actual residences in this county are vacant. They are vacation homes. And if one looks around the county and they look at all of the commercial real estate that's actually vacant, it's actually really large. So um, in all these ways to find more housing and to be inclusive and keep the tax revenue growing, you know, it seems like there's a lot of empty homes that could be utilized. So, you know, I, I miss public comments at the beginning, so I'll just be... Uh, direct towards whatever I'm talking about. Thanks guys for this presentation. And hopefully there will be a lot of community involvement because there needs to be. Thank you. Anybody else from Chambers on this item? Madam Clerk, anybody online? Yes. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. Yes, these are completely unrealistic expectations. And it's like trying to put a Band-Aid on a gushing wound of the poverty and homelessness that has only increased in the last couple of years. There's something the matter with the structure of this capitalist system where we always have 
people who are poor and unhoused and it's growing while the wealthy get uh, wealthier. And I am, say this, I said it before, I was so struck when I went to the former Soviet Union in 1966 to visit relatives and there were no homeless people on the streets. They had a housing they built up after World War II. I visited my relatives. It was small, but very adequate. There were parks outside. There, um, my relative paid about 5% of her income for rent. Um, it can be done, but it takes a different system. There is something uh, very, very wrong and egregious when people are hungry, unhoused, unemployed, and um, the money keeps moving upward. That's, that's my comments. Thank you. Anybody else online? We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, thank you. There's no action on this item. I appreciate the presentation on this item. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to our 1045 scheduled item, which is to consider a presentation by the Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks regarding the Castro Adobe, as outlined in the memo of the Chair. And we will have the Executive Director of the Friends of uh, Santa Cruz State Parks, which is Bonnie Holly. And I'll just uh, kick this item off by saying that I'd requested this uh, presentation. This is a cultural and historic treasure in South County. And although while it's in my district, it really has a lot of cultural significance uh, for Supervisor Hernandez and those in South County. Um, there's been some amazing changes to this location and uh, the community, I don't believe is very aware of it. I wanted to ensure that everybody had an opportunity to hear and see uh, this treasure in the South County. Uh, Ms. Holly, thank you for so much for being here. Thank you also for all the work you've been doing with the storm rebuild. You and your entire team have been remarkable with Seacliff and other communities across the county that have been impacted. You've been a community leader here for, for many years and I just appreciate the work uh, that you do. So Ms. Holly, thank you for being here. Good morning, Supervisor Friend. Thank you very much. Thank you, board members, Mr. Palacios, Mr. Heath, County uh, Clerk. We really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you a little bit today about the Castro Adobe Project. This is a little bit like coming home for me. I worked in this building for 21 and a half years. Um, I served some of the most honorable elected officials in this county, Joe Cuchera, Fred Keeley, John Laird, and then I specifically worked as staff in the Board of Supervisors for nine and a half years. So it's really great to be here. I've never actually been at this exact spot as a public commentator. So um, thanks for the opportunity. So you might wonder what is Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks? We are the nonprofit cooperating uh, leader and nonprofit partner with California State Parks. We support 34 state parks and beaches in Santa Cruz County and coastal San Mateo County. Our dedicated team of staff and volunteers work on a very diverse portfolio of projects. Uh, recently, we worked on the Kids to Parks Field Trip Equity Program. We created the Big Basin Day Use Reservation System that allowed that park to reopen to the public after the CZU fire. And as Supervisor Friend mentioned most recently, the Sea Cliff State Beach Recovery Fund. So we have a really dedicated team that works together. And for the past 20 years, we've been working with state parks on a project to create California's newest state historic park. Um, it will be Santa Cruz County's second state historic park and the first non-beach park in the Pajaro Valley. Uh, we've worked to preserve and restore the Castro Adobe as the heart and soul of this new state historic park. So the Castro Adobe was constructed in 1849 and 1850 by native servants of Juan Jose Castro and Rita Pinto Castro. Uh, the Castros were one of the leading founding families in Santa Cruz County and also in California. And maybe of interest to you in particular, Juan Jose Castro was elected as a county supervisor in 1853. And he was the last Latino county supervisor for 146 years until Tony Campos was elected in 1999. 
So to celebrate the restoration of the Castro Adobe, we did create a video to share with the community. Um, I'd like to acknowledge some of our team members, our volunteers and our staff who are here in the audience today. Um, I also want to particularly point out our very most rock star member who is a Friends board member. He's a park docent and he is a Castro family descendant. And you'll see him in just a minute on screen, Charlie Kiefer. So without any further ado, can we show the video? Thank you. My name is Charlie Kiefer. I am retired. I am a docent here and I give tours to the Castro Adobe, which was my family's adobe. I grew up in this area. My mother was born in this area. I was born in San Francisco and not one time did anybody ever mention that we had an adobe or that we were Castro's. So it was a great joy later on in my life to find out that I am a Castro descendant. I did not think this would ever happen. I actually thought this building's going to die. It's going to disappear. I was wrong. Today, we proudly celebrate the preservation of the Castro Adobe by recognizing all those who dedicated their time, resources, and labor to create an experience that was almost lost to the past. Built between 1849 and 1850, the Castro Adobe symbolizes the deep roots of Mexican culture here in the Pajaro Valley and in California. The property passed through several owners over the decades until California State Parks took ownership in 2002. Severely damaged by the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, the Castro Adobe was left uninhabitable and covered in tarps, a relic of its former glory. Edna Kimbrough, who owned the adobe when the earthquake hit, carved out a career advocating for the preservation and conservation of adobe structures. The effort to preserve was always more of a calling than a job for Edna. People are drawn to the Castro adobe. We are so grateful for the special community that has been created around this work and inspired by Edna. After Edna passed away in 2005 and driven by her passion, Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks led the restoration effort in collaboration with State Parks. Saving the Castro Adobe was no small feat, but Edna's legacy inspired so many people to join the cause. And in 2007, the real work was just getting started. Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks teamed up with 150 volunteers and the California Conservation Corps Together, they reconstructed 2,500 bricks, each one weighing about 85 pounds. The bricks were used to rebuild the damaged walls and launch a years-long true collaboration between friends and state parks. Over time, a new roof was installed, cracks were repaired in the walls, and seismic stabilization was installed to complete a massive retrofitting process that safeguards the adobe from future earthquakes. Friends managed and led the restoration efforts. With a successful rehabilitation underway, the park started welcoming visitors for the first time, leading the way for a new generation of Californians to appreciate the Castro adobe. Inviting local school children to experience the property was always Edna's vision for the future. This one would make a wonderful heritage park I think this building has the potential to be a symbol of Hispanic pride and a place where school children could go for an entire day and participate in a program that would deal with um, raising cattle and Hispanic rancho life. Scores of classes have visited throughout different stages of the restoration, including students participating in the exciting program, Kids to Parks. The experience that visitors have at this park is a real sensory connection to the rancho lifestyle, linking past and present. Here in the Castro Adobe's kitchen, or cocina, visitors can now experience daily life at a Mexican rancho by preparing food in the cocina. This is one of only five remaining rancho casinas in all of California. To provide universal access to the upstairs of the adobe, it was necessary to strengthen the sagging second floor. 
Led by the Friends Project Manager, a team of engineers, state parks historians, and preservation consultants agreed in 2016 on the best course of action. After years of meetings, drawings, calculations, and designs, a steel beam was threaded through the adobe brick walls, spanning the entire length of the building. This was completed in only two and a half hours. However, for everyone to appreciate the full history of the Castro Adobe, it was imperative to make the second floor accessible to all. The solution? Add a lift to the building. This innovation makes the Fandango Room available to all. It's a model for other state parks in providing access. Restoration of the Adobe continued in earnest despite the pandemic. Construction crews repaired and plastered all of the interior walls of the building, applying three to five coats of whitewash. The original painted chair rail and baseboard were meticulously conserved and restored. The exterior was also repaired and whitewashed as part of the finish work. Beyond the interior, the land itself was given a loving hand in the restoration process. The garden was fully restored in 2014, but the design plans were much older in fact, and historic in their own right. In 1969, the Castro Adobe's owner, Elizabeth Potter, consulted with famed landscape architect, Thomas Church. Those original designs from over 50 years ago were used for today's Potter Church Garden. The revival of this garden created a central gathering place on the property and gave an incredible morale boost to the overall restoration of the Castro Adobe. Thousands of curious visitors have toured the Castro Adobe during various stages of the restoration, compelling so many people to get involved. Volunteers have put on events, raised money, maintained gardens, and taken a personal interest in the progress of the state park. We invite you to share in the experience for yourself and relive a piece of our cultural heritage in the Pajaro Valley. One of the great stories about having this building is you can tell the history of California. And it is such a joy to know my family's wonderful, wonderful two-story hacienda is alive and well, and people get to come to see it. So next year, we are going to be dancing upstairs in the Fandango Room. It's going to be an absolute joy to bring back that type of history to this area. Thanks to a community full of dreamers and doers, together we have restored the Castro Adobe. It took 20 years of hope and perseverance. We are so happy to celebrate this monumental accomplishment. We proudly celebrate the diverse community that came together to make this dream a reality. The Castro Adobe will continue to share its history for generations, no longer at risk of fading into a distant memory. this story so much. I mean, this is such a treasure in South County. Uh, board members, are there, is there any comments or questions from board members, Supervisor McPherson? Yeah, this is awesome. Just absolutely awesome. And I just want to thank you who are here who helped us. I mean, this is a years long effort and just you're just to be commended. I mean, if you didn't do it, obviously it's nobody's thinking about having to get done. So this is a great tribute and a real a uh, real honorable place for the County of Santa Cruz. And thank you for sticking with it. It's been a long haul, but uh, it's awesome. It has. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Koenig. Just wanted to echo uh, that thanks to all of you who put in so many uh, hours of and so much sweat, uh, equity and labor and love into this project. It's really a beautiful outcome. I look forward to visiting. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. Same. I just want to thank all all the volunteers as well, and all the doll sense, everybody that you know took everybody that volunteered as well. You know, so many so many children from South County go visit the visit the the Adobe House from grade school to uh, elementary school, middle school, and every time you know they they go, they're awed by the house and the history yes. um, that that took place there in South County. So thank you. It's a treasure in our community. 
Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Supervisor much. Hernandez. Supervisor Cummings. Thank you. I just want to thank you and everyone who's worked on this. Um, this is the first time I've really heard about this. And, you know, I feel like I learn more and more um, each time I sit through these meetings and we see these various presentations. And so I'm excited to share this with other folks that I know who might not be aware of this so that we can help contribute to keeping this part of our history alive in Santa Cruz County. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Holly. I do have a question because, I mean, to Supervisor Cummings' point, I think a lot of people aren't aware of this treasure in our community. So could you share how the community could get involved with the continued restoration of this, this project and also maybe how they could also visit? Absolutely. So we do have monthly open house events. Um, the next one is on February 11th from 1030 to 330. And we are taking pre-registrations at that'smypark.org. Uh, we also are always recruiting volunteers, docent volunteers, garden volunteers, people to help with maintenance of the property. Uh, we also, of course, as was mentioned, um, there are school field trips. We have uh, the Kids to Parks program. There are virtual field trips, in-person field trips, and hybrid field trips. Uh, we also, of course, accept donations and shopping. We have Castro Adobe merchandise that's available at our park store online and also at pop-up events at our uh, at our events out there. So there are lots of ways to get involved and uh, be happy to give any of you a tour of the Adobe anytime you and your staff would like to take us up on that. Um, it is a treasure um, in our community and we're really proud to show it off. And then I also just say sort of what comes next now that the Adobe has been restored, we're gonna take the next steps to finish off this park project. So we'll be creating a visitor center, accessible pathways, restoring the habitat lands, putting in interpretation. We have a theme called If These Walls Could Talk. So the building actually tells you the story of the people who've lived and worked there over the years. Um, so we're really looking forward to working with community on next steps. Thank you, Ms. Holly. And to all of you that have volunteered on this and that are here today, I mean, you're what makes our community great. Um, this is, uh, you're leaving a legacy. This is a historic legacy, but it, we could have lost it. And you're leaving it for uh, the next generation. My son was, you know, he's just turned eight, but when he was three, he went to one of some of the early events that were there and, you know, helped cook. <laughs> and just, he's, he loves it. It's still it's an imprinted memory that he absolutely loves. And so, just think about this legacy that you're all leaving. It's an amazing thing. Thank you. I remember that day and um, visitors can press tortillas and cook them on the Bercero and it's really a sensory experience. So I invite you all to come out. I also have some educational materials for you. We did publish a book a number of years ago called The Castro Adobe from Earthquake to Earthquake. So I have a copy for each board member and also for Mr. Palacios. Should I give those to the clerk? Please. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Holly. Since you're used to sitting through these, you're welcome to stay for the continued um, items. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Supervisor McPherson said he'll be one of your garden volunteers. That's it. He's, I'm a, in he's an expert. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to um, item 10, which is to consider approval and concept of the uncodified ordinance of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors amending ordinance 5423 related to the effective date of amendments to the Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 13.10 as part of the sustainability policy and regulatory update of 2022 and scheduled the uncodified ordinance for second reading and final adoption on February 14th, 2023, as outlined in the memo of the deputy CAO. I know that this is just a cleanup uh, language board item, but Ms. Hansen. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair, uh, Supervisors. In December of last year, the board adopted the sustainability Ms. policy. Ms. Hanson, I think that your microphone is not on. Thank you. Oh. Um, the board adopted the sustainability policy and regulatory update, which was a major update of our general plan um, and county code and, and involved over 10 years of work to um, compile that program and get it before the, the board. Um, its major focus was to um, update our policies and regulations to really en encourage more infill development and develop more sustainable communities uh, within the county. There were nine ordinances that it took. The board will, I'm sure, remember. Um, 
to uh, adopt those ordinances and um, the vast majority of those amendments um, are part of our local coastal program that has to be approved by the Coastal Commission before it can go into effect. Um, ordinance 5423 was one of those nine ordinances and amended our zoning code. So it was a pretty important one. Um, the ordinance contained an administrative effort, uh, error, excuse me, which bifurcated the ordinance, meaning it would go into effect um, outside the coastal zone immediately and then inside the coastal zone once it was approved by the Coastal Commission. Um, while we sometimes do bifurcate our ordinances when we think there's real value to the people outside the coastal zone, um, in this case, all of this project um, was intended to be reviewed by the Coastal Commission. And because these codes are intricately tied um, to the general plan and those amendments, and in fact, some of the residential zones that are new, the residential flex zone needs to be established by the general plan before the code can go into effect. Um, we can't have them going into effect separately. So um, this ordinance is just an administrative procedure to correct that error. Um, and our recommended actions are to approve the uh, ordinance and concept and then schedule it for second reading at the next meeting on February 14th. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Seems pretty straightforward. Are there any questions from board members? Supervisor Koenig. Just a brief question. Do we have any sense uh, from Coastal Commission staff when this is going to make it on their agenda? We don't yet, um, but we are um, uh, about to schedule a meeting with them to start to talk about how they might divide up the project. Um, we are uh, have a real interest in seeing some of the residential portions of the general plan and the county code in effect. And so if they're going to, you know, it's a huge um, package. So if they need time, we're going to ask them to um, potentially divide those things up so we can have our housing um, regulations in effect in time for the housing element. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Ray, I'm just really happy that Santa Cruz County is We've got a format for how we're going to address climate change challenges with these two documents and uh, the climate action plan as well. Uh, we're uh, comparatively ahead of the game uh, throughout the state of California. I'm glad we have this in place. Uh, we just got to put it to work and make it make it work for this county. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address this on this item? Yeah, good morning, Stu. James Ewing Whitman. Um, I'm not sure exactly what is involved with 5423, but it does make a reference to 310, where on December 6th in the afternoon, this board chose to link agenda items 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 into just instead of commenting for two minutes on each, whoever was here, and I was the only one in the county to comment. Um, you know, learning how to navigate, how to use the system unknown to me until a few days before, when you look at the major binder, you know, it may have 1800 pages, but in relation to agenda items 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 on December 6th, which do relate to this agenda item 10, um, initially only about 270 pages were available. But when I learned how to look at it more carefully, and you know, we're always learning, there is an additional 2,104 pages that weren't initially included. So I guess I was the only one to make a legal request that this stuff could be looked at within 90 days or whatever you've changed it to. So I guess I'm glad that I'm here for the um, meeting today because I would have liked to have been here on time, but obviously I was delayed. So this will just be interesting to see if more members of the public will actually uh, be in more action to work with you guys to do the best job for everything. How's that for being nice? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers? Is there anybody online, Madam Clerk? We do not have any speakers online. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for action. Of the recommended actions? Second. A motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? And Friend? Aye. And passes.
And we'll move on to uh, the one item that was pulled from the consent agenda, which is now item 11.1, .1, which was item 38 on the consent agenda, which is to authorize the Community Development and Infrastructure Department to return to the board on February 14th, 2023, with a proposed amendment of the current contract with Four Leaf Incorporated to extend the term of the contract and add a new scope of services for consultant as recommended uh, by Supervisor Koenig and myself. We're happy to discuss the item, but uh, Supervisor McPherson, you pulled the item, so please introduce your concerns. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair, friend, and Supervisor Koenig for bringing this item to the board. I, I think it's imperative that we have a clear and expedited uh, process to help folks rebuild after the, the storms, just as we have endeavored after the CZU fire, not just talk about COVID and 2016, 17 storms as well. I, I pulled this item for discussion uh, because I wanted to clarify a few, few things about uh, the scope of work and they ask for more data about the fire recovery process. Um, and I have a couple of questions and I don't know if there's someone here that could answer them about, I know the amendment is going to come back to us at the next meeting, but can we say whether uh, now, whether uh, Orleaf will be adding uh, other resources to handle the additional workload? Uh, that's one question. And, and do we anticipate needing additional county personnel to provide uh, the approvals and this problem solving that we're experiencing now um, and uh, the residents that have run into the challenges that we have. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Carolyn Burke, assistant director with CDI. And um, let's see, so the the way the four leaf contract model works, we will add, they're able to add as many staff as necessary to take care of the workload that's coming in the door and maintain our expedited review times. So that's the that's kind of the um, benefit of using Four Leaf is that they can flex their staffing levels to be able to meet demand and maintain the expedited times. And and the board uh, letter states that Four Leaf will assist in uh, constituent um, facing activities um, like community outreach and disseminating uh, public information. Uh, do we anticipate that the uh, Consultants, um, you got to take the lead on that outreach or uh, the timing of it, or how does the county specifically get into that? Well, let's see. Um, so as far as outreach, uh, we definitely, CDI coordinates very closely with Four Leaf staff and developing the information, such as the RPC website that they currently have. The county um, staff did a, a good portion of that work and then as well as four leaf staff to get what we have up there today. And so we'd be doing the same to do that that type of outreach. Um, I'm I'm closely connected with our CBO and the uh, chief building off official in the RPC. And we come up with that together. As far as outreach, we also work with OR3, Office of Response Recovery and Resilience to support them in any um, events and activities that they've um, um, prepared similar to what we've done now attending town halls or um, different events up in the valley for CZU recovery. Okay, I, I'm I'm supportive of us going in this direction with Four Leaf, and I just want to ensure that we um, are going to achieve the objective that we have, uh, which is to be as helpful as we can to those uh, in the rebuilding process. And I want to ensure that uh, we're not unintentionally uh, diluting our ability to continue the fire rebuilding process, but I think you've explained the process. And in my, what I've seen is as of Monday on the CZU uh, rebuilding dashboard for single family homes, we have 221 permits in process, 167 issued and ready to be picked up and another 197 that have all three clearances and could uh, submit a permit but have not done so we get asked about these numbers all the time i know in my office and i'm sure in some of your offices and also that's about 600 units which is about two-thirds of the homes burned in the fire but i'd like to get more information about why property owners uh with clearances have not come in for permits and why those issued permits uh have not been picking them up and it's you'd have to go to a one by one basis but um and, and how we're going to work through this process um i'm just a little concerned of how it's gone to, uh, i just don't know the answers to those things and there won't be a single answer to, for any of them but i'd like to see some analysis to help inform how we manage uh, the storm rebuilding and the, what the success looks like um and what we should realistically expect um 
what I would like for additional direction to the staff is to return to the board on February 14th with both some contact a contract amendment and a plan for how the county will collect and analyze both the uh, data and the reasons behind the figures. Um, permits issued but not picked up, clearances approved but no permits submitted, permits in the process and strategies used to address the problem of delays. I'm not I'm not putting blame on anybody. I just want to get the answers because I've been asked these questions time and time again and I I really don't have a good answer for it. And I think we can, I would like to see us uh, like to add these directives uh, to this and to come back to us on February 14th. Can I just ask a point of clarification possibly for council? Is this a, you're asking for a contract amendment, but isn't this just information coming back from CDI that answers these questions? I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand why we would add this to a contract is what I'm asking, or maybe I'm missing the point, but it sounds like he's trying to modify the contract authorization to have this language come back from four leaf where it strikes me that this is just information that we can already obtain from four leaf. We don't need a contract to do it. And then they just receive direction to come back with a report. Yeah, I agree. I agree with what you're saying. The, the 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 item before the board is is for a contract amendment, and the additional direction doesn't necessarily relate to the contract amendment. It's more of a request to get a report back from staff on a future agenda regarding these issues. Um, either way, I think it's it's a it's a similar ask of the board. Yeah, I think it's an appropriate additional direction. I just didn't think it was uh, the language you'd use, Supervisor McPherson, was would modify the actual contract amendment. I, I just didn't think that that's what we're directing somebody to do here. As long as we can uh, direct the staff to to come back with that information or, or have them know exactly what we are seeking, because I haven't, been, we just haven't been able to get it yet, uh, to my satisfaction anyway. And I think, um, well, I'm not going to speak for the third district, but I think for the third district feels much the same uh but uh supervisor cummins i don't want to put you on the spot because you just got here in the aftermath of all of this so uh but um i think that's the case so well what, what what we're hearing as staff is just is is just there's two separate issues there there's the contract amendment with four leaf and there's also an analysis regarding the efficacy of using four leaf and um and issues related to whether folks are picking their permits up or doing yeah, uh, just, rebuilding and the like. And I think staff can do both those things. Okay. Um, that, that'd be satisfactory to me if uh, under the circumstances, uh, and I think, um, well, I'm not speaking for any other supervisor, but I think uh, it'd be great to have that type of information. But I think it still belongs as additional direction. I think it should be formalized. I was just trying to make sure that we didn't complicate a contract. contract. Process. I got it. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'll get to you, Justin, What's, uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair, friend. Uh, yeah, thank you, Supervisor McPherson, for asking for that information. It's something that's consistently, uh, I've had to scratch my head about a little bit when looking at our um, recovery dashboard. I mean, it seems like we're making great progress, but you know, I, I wonder as well, why aren't people picking up their permits and what happened to the other one third that doesn't, of homes that were destroyed that doesn't seem to be accounted for there. I um, mean, you know, I appreciate what you're getting at that um, you wouldn't want the uh, additional work that we do for storm uh, storm repair and rebuilds to, you know, further push back anything in the process for people who are still trying to recover from a disaster two years ago. So um, definitely sympathetic to that. Um, you know, I'll just say, I, I think that as you said, Ms. Burke, uh, the way this, the way four leaf works, uh, they can kind of, you know, can add as many uh, additional uh, hands or help as needed to be able to process the um, sort of unanticipated number of applications that we're sure to get out of this. Uh, I'll also just add, I mean, every time I go to see someone's home that was destroyed by floodwaters where they had two feet in uh, of water and mud in, you know, in some cases, brand new, newly renovated units, uh, trying to provide that housing for the community and then just having it ripped away. Uh, I'm always left wondering, you know, how can we do more? Um, it always feels like just, you know, there's only so many things that we can do and it's never enough. Um, this is something that we can do. And it's something that we've been doing effectively uh, for the for fire victims. And I, th I think that we can do effectively for uh, victims of these most recent storms. And of course, the one-stop model that uh, Four Leaf provides is something we're seeking to emulate with our own planning department and the Unified Permit Center. Uh, of course, there's you know, it's it's a, a process to stand that up. I think it'd be too much to try to uh, labor and just 
you know, just our planning department with all these uh, new permits we're sure to see, and that this uh, work with working with four leaf in the short term will provide the best solution. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Cummings. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I just want to express my appreciation of Supervisor McPherson's additional direction. Um, it's something that's been a concern of mine and some of the residents uh, in our district as well, just around timing of when people are rebuilding the, the permits and how they're going through the process. Um, but in addition to that, I have some other concerns, um, given that we're having this discussion about four leaf that I thought were important to bring up. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been hearing from, from fire survivors in the third district um, is that there's sometimes disputes between four leaf and people who are trying to rebuild. And uh, it doesn't seem like there's any kind of intermediary at the county for where, when those disputes arise, where people should take those disputes. And so, for example, there's been concerns that um, with some of the enhanced septic systems that for new buildings, that that's you know something that might be required by state, but for people who are rebuilding, there should be opportunities for them to use you know these less expensive systems to help them more easily rebuild. And it sounds like there's disputes between uh, staff at Four Leaf and uh, individuals who are trying to rebuild. And so it might be that there's you know some code or some reason why they can't you know they have to go to the enhanced septic system, but it's also not clear um, that they're getting any kind of real explanation. And then from there, they don't really know who to go to. Um, and we've had some conversations with other county staff who also felt like they weren't sure whether it's building materials or enhanced septic systems. Um, who they if if a if a resident has an issue and a and a dispute with four leaf, it's not clear to them who they should go to as well. And so um, so that's something I wanted to bring up and and felt that. You know, I want to add a little bit of additional direction to that, which would be for when staff returns to the board, that they come back with recommendations for a process to deal with disputes between four leaf staff and disaster survivors, appoint a county staff person to manage that process and keep survivors, uh, keep our supervisor's office informed about that. And I think it's just going to become even more complicated when you have now flood survivors and fire survivors who are coming with their concerns. And if there's any kind of dispute between Four Leaf and the victims, uh, there needs to be someone in the county who, who we can direct these people to. Any other comments from board members? I'll just briefly say uh, the rationale, sort of the top line, so we don't lose track of this, as to why we brought this item forward was, the two of us brought this item forward is because people are hurting and we need to expedite a process to try and do everything we can from a county perspective to not be in the way of their rebuild because it's not just physical in the buildings, it's, it's emotional. And we're dealing with it on the fire side. Supervisor McPherson was hit again on the flood side. Um, and a number of us are doing it on the flood side. This will help do that. Um, there's no perfect process at all. Um, I think that the information coming back is important. Um, and I think that, that these recommendations are good, but I didn't want to lose track of why we brought the item forward in the first place. Because, and, and this is a very important item, and the county is doing everything it can do to not be a regulatory barrier to people's lives being rebuilt, their livelihoods being rebuilt, and their families being able to re, you know, have a, a home or a business rebuilt. And so I think that uh, this is good, and I wanted to compliment uh, the work of CDI and their openness for this. Uh, contract amendment. Yeah, you know, I want to say uh, congratulations to, uh, I know it's hard for some of these that want to rebuild to believe, but we're doing a better job than most other fire, uh, other counties that have experienced fires or floods or whatever the case may be. So I, I don't want to make this, um, I, I just want to be uh, complimentary, but I want to get just to see the facts and figures more clearly so we can we can pass it on to the public. I will open it up for the community then on this item before we bring it back to the board for a motion. Anybody from the community like to address us? Yeah, it's James. I think it was Mr. McPherson who took this off the agenda, the consent agenda. I think that's fabulous. Any smiling or irony personally would have been because I'm trying to reuse my journals and this date stops at uh, July 31st. So. The tragedy of the CZU fires, what was that, August 17th of 2020? I came in here and spoke quite a bit about that. I haven't said much about the flood stuff because that happened in between meetings. So 
what I, I, I've worked on some projects for the CZU fires and I'm aware of lots of issues that have come up and there's still a lot of physical evidence that I just won't go into detail about, but I know that I only started showing up here, you know, April of 2020. And it would be my guess that there's probably been at least 40,000 pages that were physically printed that have gone through who knows how many more have been printed. So it's entirely possible that there are some difficulties due to some, what seems like some tiny regulations, like let's say septic systems that are becoming very expensive for people to actually do. Um, I don't know. I was trying to pay attention, but what are the 221 permits uh, have been applied for 167 issued. 197 have all the clearances. It's my understanding that over 900 dwellings were destroyed during this fire. So um, I would just like to personally witness you guys walking your talk about helping people. And that's why I'm glad I'm here. Thanks. Anyone else from Chambers like to address us? Is there anybody online, Madam Clerk? We have no speakers, Chair. All right, so I'll bring it back to the board for action uh, for if there's a motion for the recommended actions plus additional direction of Supervisor Cummings to you, would you like to make a motion? Yes, I'll move um, item number 38 with the recommended actions and also include the, the additional direction provided by Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Cummings. Second. And is there understanding of what the additional direction is, Madam Clerk? We're okay. The clerk would appreciate our... Um a brief recap of, of the additional directions. We can capture that accurately. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Do you mind uh, stating from your end the additional direction and we'll try and capture Supervisor McPherson's as well? Sure, uh, the additional direction that I provided was um, that when this item returns to the board, the staff come back with recommendation for a process to deal with disputes between Four Leaf staff and disaster survivors appoint a county staff to manage that process and keep the supervisor's office informed. And Supervisor McPherson, the data you would like as well in that report? Yeah, the permits issued, but not picked up. Uh, the clearance is approved, but no permits submitted. Uh, the permits and process and strategies used to address the problems or delays. Council, we're clear, it's okay. Thank you, right. I appreciate and that clerk, greatly. Absolutely, so we have a motion um, from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Koenig with additional direction. If we could have a roll call, please. Apologies, Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. Item passes unanimously as amended. Thank you. Um, at this point, we're going to move into closed session. Is there anything anticipated to be reportable at a closed session? No. All right. Then our next meeting will be on February 14th. We appreciate everybody for being here. We appreciate Community TV for their work today as well.